A jeszcze mi nie działa mikrofon. First time. Mikrofon, mikrofon wyłączył. Raz, dwa, trzy.
Hello, can you hear us? Uh, yes, yes, I can. It's okay. The sound is clearly, I guess. Good, good. Okay, so Milena is a host and she will write you on the chat uh, the instruction, okay? Okay, I will disconnect uh, the, the audio now. Okay. in this model. <laughs> May I start? Okay. So, good morning, dear friends and colleagues. This is a big honor and pleasure for me to host you all on the international conference Territorial and Interorganizational Cooperation 2020. Today, we are here in Brenna, which is a real proper place on the Polish-Czech-Slovak borderland for uh, events like this. Yes. I also would like to in welcome all of you who participate in this conference online. And I hope that next year you will be able to join us here in Poland. At the beginning, I would like to present you a short video prepared especially for the conference participants by Professor Katarzyna szczepańska woszczyna Vice Rector of WSB University and the Dean of Faculty of Applied Science. Unfortunately, Professor Szczepańska today is in Warsaw and she has some duties there, so she is not able to be here with us. But I hope that tomorrow she will participate online. So, look at the video now. The distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the International Conference Territorial and Interorganizational Cooperation 2020, which is addressed to researchers and practitioners dealing with different aspects of territorial and interorganizational cooperation in the context of the local, regional and international dimension. We are glad to have all of you here to share your knowledge and experience. I would like to express my appreciation for all conference patronages and welcome their representatives. The Minister of Science and Higher Education in Poland, Academia Europa Nostra, represented by Dr. Tomasz Studzieniecki, Eurovision Cieszyn Sajwizja, represented by Tomasz Balcar, Janusz Pierzyna and Bogdan Kasperk, Mayor of Brenna Commune, Jerzy Pilch, the Scientific Society of Organization and Management branch in Dąbrowa Górnicza, represented by Professor Joanna Kurowska Pysz, the Commission for Polish Czech and Polish Slovak Relations of the Polish Academy of Science, represented by Professor Wojciech Świątkiewicz, and the European Regional Science Association, Polish section, represented by Dr. Tomasz Kosowski. The conference is organized also under the patronage of Rector of WSB University, Professor Zdzisława Daskopikiewicz, Rector of Gdynia, Gdynia Maritime University, Professor Adam Weintritt. Thank you very much for your engagement. I would like to extend my special warm welcome to our distinguished guests who have traveled so far to be with us. Today in this hall we have representatives from at least 20 countries. All of you live and work in certain countries, but in your involvement you really have no borders and you cross borders through your scientific work almost every day. I wish you a pleasant stay in Poland. The conference is focused not only the scientific discussion during the plenary sessions, but also networking during the roundtables debate and other events. This is a key competitive advantage of Research Institute of Territorial and Interorganizational Cooperation, which strongly encourages scientists and practitioners to cooperate, share the knowledge and experience, as well as develop research projects together. Thank you very much for joining us. I wish you successful research. Stay healthy. My dear all, uh, I'm very happy that after lockdown, we are reborn as an active international academic community with a new potential to do and uh, create big things. When I started this conference preparation in December last year, 
I was sure that it will be a big international event with many scientists, practitioners here in Bren. Then, after COVID-19 outbreak, I had many doubts if it's reasonable to continue, continue the event preparation. Uh, because, as you know, after March 2020, many things in our life have changed. Finally, I realized that the scientific world entered in a new era of international communication and collaboration, thanks to numerous online platforms. So this is a challenge and this is a chance that we have to use. So in this way, WSB University team prepared this conference, focusing on networking, scientific discussions, debates between participants who are here in Brenna and other participants who join us online this time. Many thanks for my colleagues from the Science Development Department WSB University, who are here in Brenna, and also for those who are in Dombrova Gurnicza now. I appreciate your support. Special thanks for our great keynote speakers, Professor Marina Andeva, Professor Alexandros Apostolakis, Professor Jacinto Gerardo Velarde, Professor Dangis Gudelis, Professor Eduardo Medeiros, and Professor James Scott. Many thanks for Professor Martin Klatt, who will moderate the plenary session today. I also would like to thank the moderators and the scientists who prepared the introductions to the debates, Professor Wojciech Opioła, Professor Hynek Bem, Professor Francesco Capellano, Professor Kostadin Kolarov, Professor Christina Pritula, and Professor Tomasz Studieniecki. And many thanks for all the roundtables debate participants here in Brenna and participants online. Because thank, thanks to you, the scientific activities come to life again. So we did our best to prepare a diverse conference program, and we tried to provide a good opportunity for a scientific discussion and networking, not only during the plenary sessions, but also during the roundtable debates that is something innovative for us, let's say. We will focus on many topics related to territorial and interorganizational cooperation uh, issues during the conference, but we also suggest you to participate in interesting accompanying events that will take place here in Brenna today and tomorrow. Uh, the detailed information you can find in the agenda, and they are also included in the booklet that was sent to you all yesterday by mail. Uh, I would like also add that the conference is organized thanks to the funds from the Polish Ministry of Science and Higher Education. And the ministry supports me much, not only this conference, but also my uh, research institute on territorial and interorganizational cooperation and my scientific school of cross-border cooperation. So thanks to the support we can develop uh, the scientific school, and we can uh, develop many research, many projects, and many publications with you. So I wish you all a fruitful participation in the conference, um, many new contacts and uh, opportunities to develop the research and common activities together. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Martin Glad to moderate the plenary sessions. Martin, the floor is yours. And I would like to ask if our keynote speakers are with us. Yes? OK. So we will try for the first session. Thank you, Joanna, for inviting me to the conference and for asking me to moderate this session. We have six very interesting keynote speakers with a very diverse background, so it's, you will hear a lot of different talks this morning, it would not just be the same. First keynote speaker is Eduardo Medeiros from the University of uh, Lisbon, he's a geographer. He is a, an expert on territorial cooperation, has close cooperation with Didi Rijo. He just published an interesting article um, in the uh, Journal of 
Borderlands studies? Was it European planning studies? I'm sorry, Dado, I forgot. European planning studies. I have read it about these very new developments on the borders with COVID-19. And, uh, and this article was published in cooperation with three uh, important persons who are not researchers, but who work as practitioners in helping cross-border cooperation, Jean Peroni from the MOT in Paris, Mission Operationnelle Transfolia, uh, Kula Okshai from the CSCI in Budapest, Hungary, and Martin Guillermo Ramirez, General Secretary of the European Associ Association of European Border Regions. So it's a very good example, too, of how we in the border studies community try to engage with practitioners and uh, to present policy-relevant research. Eduardo will talk about territorial cooperation and territorial integration, which of course is the ultimate aim of territorial cooperation. But uh, I will not talk more now, but give the word to you, Eduardo. Okay, while we try to get connections, uh, some uh, uh, issues about etiquette, formalities, we will have, the speakers have about 20 minutes, we will have some time for questions and answers, uh, questions in the audience, I will see questions from the online audience, please use the chat function or write it down in YouTube and then we will, I will also get your question too, so you are very welcome to participate in our discussions too.
Martin? Hello? Hello? I don't Hello. see anyone. We can see you, uh, we can hear you, but uh, and we will shortly see you, I hope. Hello? Hello? Hello, Martin. Uh, I don't know what happened. I had to change the computer. I don't know if it's my, my computer that had a problem, but uh, the, the connection was always going down and uh, now I have to copy everything to a new computer. I'm trying to copy now my new presentation. So I have to copy the link. I, I see you, but I don't see my camera. <laughs> yeah, we so, cannot also see you, but we can hear you. So. Okay. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm trying to bring my presentation uh, okay. so I can start to do this. Uh, you have to check the, uh, the... Can you activate the sharing of the... so I can make my presentation... Uh, let me see. So... I need an activation to, to start to make my presentation. Uh, I need a permission. Yes, you have. I have it. Let me see if I can find now. You are the co-host now. Okay, so wait a minute. Let me just see. Because... Professor Medeiros, can yes, I yes, may I ask you to uh, turn the sound, turn off the sounds on your YouTube transmission, because probably we I have some. Have, I don't have the YouTube connected. Okay. We can. We still can't um, see you, and your computer and your screen. Mm. Is it possible for you that you sent your presentation? I have it here now. Oh yeah, we can see your presentation just now. Okay. It's, okay, can I start? Yes, can go I ahead, please. My, can I start my presentation? Yes, please. Can I start? Yes. Can okay, you hear thank us? you, Martin. Sorry for everything. I think it was a problem with the other computer. I don't know. Don't but worry. First of all, I'd like to thank the organization, especially Professor Joanna Kurowska for the uh, invitation and to speak as a keynote speaker in this very interesting event. So uh, indeed in pandemic times, we have affected um, uh, this particular cross-border process and flows in uh, uh, Europe. And uh, so it's particularly interesting and relevant to discuss this process of European territorial cooperation, which can be generically understood as a process of systematic reduction of all sorts of persisting border barriers. In this context, I will start my presentation by invoking this title of the latest book from Andreas Fallodi, which is kind of self-explanatory. You know, it's the poverty of territorialism. Also, territorialism is, in a generic sense, the paradigm we are living for the past couple of centuries in which the world is divided into different nation states and countries. For Fallodi, territorialism provokes this series of territorial development bottlenecks, you know, um, since it undermines, for instance, territorial functional relations and other uh, sustainable territorial coalitions. So in this sense, we have uh, been advocating for quite a long time the implementation of a one world, one system paradigm or a global deterritorialism governance paradigm as a concrete policy action to reduce these negative effects posed by the presence of these national boundaries. And you can see some of these paradigm there uh, in this uh, slide. So um, it was with some interest that uh, we listened to the State of the Union speech from the President of the European Commission, um, which I basically subscribe, but um, I would really expect her to bring forward specific measures that could avoid the problems posed by this copied fencing process. You know, in essence, this closing of the national boundaries due to the spreading of the COVID-19. 
Because as many sources have pointed out, many of these measures have led to local, regional population and entities protests, since COVID fencing has undermined the normal functioning of cross-border commuting in several cross-border passages and the economy of cross-border areas, many of them. But also at the national level, this poverty of territorialism, I think it was very visible in the need that some countries have for cross-border workers to maintain their public services, namely hospitals. As examples, Luxembourg needed to keep its borders open from cross-border medical workers coming from, from France. There was even proposals to keep some of these uh, workers in Luxembourg. Um, um, and the same happened with Switzerland, Austria, which, for instance, needs cross-border med medical workers from Eastern European countries. So it was with great satisfaction that I saw the creation of this cross-border alliance by MO, ABR, SESHI, which realized that similar future pandemic scenarios require a different approach. There is a need to contain spread of these pandemics at their source. This does not necessarily imply the shutdown of national boundaries. So in my view, the EU should support a one Europe, one system approach of the territorialism. It is true that economic, in the economic arena, we have had a good example of the euro, but we all know that uh, as it stands, this coin beneficiates a few countries like Germany, Holland. For it to function, to benefit the, the whole eurozone, there is a need to have a common fiscal system. And I would argue a similar salary system. And I see no reasons why my salary is not similar from, for instance, my German and Denmark Danish colleagues. And then um, the, the minimum wage that the president of the commission defends should provide dignity to the worker. I agree. But it should also have the same value within the EU. And as uh, President Obama has stated before, the ones that work cannot be poor. If they produce, they cannot be poor. This should be the main guideline of uh, all policies. Alongside uh, and following from the recent work of the European Commission on the persistent border barriers in Europe, it is known that most relevant Europeans uh, for Europeans are administrative, uh, 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 administrative legal character. These include barriers related to the presence of different social security systems, diploma recognition, in addition, language continues to be regarded as one of the three main cross-border barriers encountered by Europeans. In this regard, there is a need to provide key information for cross-border workers in a common language, not only the national language, but also in a common language, which, let's face it, it's English, which is widely accepted as the universal language. Furthermore, there's a lot of work to be done to normalize cross-border transport systems, information, ticketing, scheduling, and other, because um, by now there is around 2 million cross-border uh, workers uh, in Europe, 400,000 of which come from, from France. So, um, as we know, this uh, concept of um, European integration uh, encompasses several analytic dimensions, institutional, cultural, economic, social. Instead, the notion of European territorial integration, if you put the territory there, it's more associated with the, the goal of reducing border barriers. Uh, so it has a close connotation with the notion of cross-border cooperation, which ultimately should be, in my view, a policy goal aiming at reducing these persisting border barriers. So in this regard, and following from my own studies, um, I, it is clear that the contribution of these cross-border cooperation uh, policies, programs, uh, projects have contributed to reducing these border barriers uh, in the past years in Europe. Uh, for instance, in the first three Portuguese-Spanish interact programs, it, it was dedicated 70% of the total funding to the construction of new cross-border physical accessibilities. These include um, uh, the still most uh, iconic and financed interreg project, the, the bridge that links Guadiana and Andalusia, the Guadiana Bridge. So uh, it is still the, the only cross-border physical connection between these two regions, still as far as I, as I know. So um, there was indeed <clears throat> um, many ish situations that occur with this uh, pandemic all across Europe. You have this map that um, presents the location of these um, in situations um, taken from the Committee of the Region platform um, that has been collected all this information. And many of these um, um, issues are related to health issues. Um, and also to cross-border commuting. And this spreads all across European borders, but it's especially concentrated on the area where this cross-border commuting is stronger, you know, in the northeastern part of, of the French border. Um, as stated, the three most persisting uh, border barriers in Europe are respectively the ones related with legal administrative issues, the language, the lack of difficulty uh, in physical connections, um, public transports, 
uh, including I'm aware that inter aggregate programs cannot by themselves solve all these cross-border barriers, especially the ones related with legal and administrative um, character, since they require also national and uh, EU intervention. But the COVID, COVID fencing, you know, can be used to identify certain areas of policy intervention which can help to mitigate these border barriers, as is the case of the problems encountered in the functioning of public services, such as hospitals, cross-border transport, which are largely stopped or placed at the minimum service by now. And there were also several situations which affected the normal function of cross-border commuting, in particular in Eastern European borders. So the following map will finalize my presentation because I already took a lot of time due to this issue of the computer. Um, starting with this accessibility related barriers, you know, we used uh, our own data, which was collected in 2017 on the presence and capacity of cross-border public transport in Europe, you know, cross-border buses and trains. This kind of shows some of the darker areas, uh, which are the areas which I think in the next programming period, uh, the EU cross-border cooperation program should invest more in improving this cross-border cooperation um, um, accessibility. Uh, I think the institutional level, it is known that um, time is key to consolidate cross-border institutional formal arrangements. You know, so um, it is only normal that the countries and cross-border areas which have engaged in uh, formal cross-border cooperation since the uh, mid 1950s, like the, the Nordic countries and the uh, northwest of Europe, have uh, the best results here. So um, it's also um, clear that. Um, Many other cross-border areas have um, improved a lot in these uh, institutional cross-border arrangements, namely with the implementations of Euro regions and the EGTCs. But there's still a lot to do in this arena in many uh, parts of, the, of Europe. In economic cooperation, this is basically data that comes from our colleagues uh, from Polytechno Milano, which show that cross-border areas where there is a higher economic capital potential are the ones that should be explored the most. And this is uh, here in the areas where you, know, you have the richer Europe. Um, in social cooperation, there's still a lot to do. Um, this uh, map was based on data that was collected from this recent ESPON study, which identified many existing cases of cross-border public services, which still need to be further explored, basically all across EU um, uh, border areas, to increase the level of social cooperation in this domain. And finally, in the cultural cooperation domain, uh, this was supported by a uh, European Commission report, which I, act, I acted as an advisor, so I had access to this data, which identified several um, Eastern European uh, cross-border areas, and also some in Scandinavia and Iberian Peninsula, which still required the mitigation of substantial cultural barriers. But let's face it, the most important cultural barrier that exists in Europe is language. And uh, from my studies, um, most of the borders that are uh, uh, um, linked to Ger Germany are the ones that face bigger problems when it comes to this uh, um, uh, language barrier. So i sorry for everything and uh, thank you for uh, um, once again for the invitation. I'll finish my presentation now. I give the word to Martin. Thank you, Iados. You had plenty of time, uh, so you really, really kept the time frame. Um, so we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. I have no yes, Hunek. Boom. Wait, do you need the microphone? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello Eduardo. So well, I can see you but you can't see me. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh thanks a lot for your interesting presentation. Firstly let me I guess on behalf of, of our team, congratulate you to the article you published with the European Public Studies, as Martin mentioned, with the colleagues. It was really uh, nice, one of the first reactions to the uh, COVID-19 crisis from a border scholar, and this was really very interesting. Thank you for introducing the term COVID fencing. So I like it, so I will, I will use it if I may. Uh, and then uh, let me ask the question, what will be, in your opinion, do you observe like several uh, uh, regional scenarios, what will be the, let's say, mid or long term impact of this COVID fencing on the individual parts of Europe? Do you have got some kind of the prospects where would you expect that the impacts will be really bad and long lasting and where the impacts uh, will not be so severe? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Einek, for your uh, kind words and uh, 
and um, hope we see each other uh, again. And um, I can only speculate. Nobody knows what is going to come out of this uh, the, uh, this um, this uh, article that I wrote with uh, Martin uh, Bula and uh, Jean was, um, you know, as we say in the conclusions, um, it's just uh, an initial uh, analysis of this process. So I can speculate, I can give you my opinion. I think that maybe two years from now, we will we will go back to the way we, we were. Some things will, of course, change. I think um, in two years from now, everybody will have a lot of data and we will understand better what were the impacts of this COVID fencing in, uh, all across Europe, not only in the cross-border regions, but in, in, in all situations. It's still too early to know uh, with the data that we have. But with the information that I have, what I can speculate is that um, I think we all learned that shutting down the national boundaries um, just like that didn't work very well. You know, um, um, the, the territorialism process um, has been starting in Europe, and I don't think it will go back just like that, because as long as uh, uh, the economies of uh, cross-border regions beneficiate from the opening of the border, and in the end, it's all about the money. If they beneficiate economically, they will do everything to keep the borders open. You know, first and foremost is always economy, because this is what gives uh, money to the people, this is what gives jobs, this is what maintains politicians in their, in their, in their places. So if it gives money, um, people will follow what gives money. So uh, I think many, many cross-border regions have understood that they cannot just shut down border uh, areas just like that, that is beneficiated for everybody, that borders are open as much as possible. And I think this is one of the, um, the key messages from the COVID fencing. Uh, if that's going to work or not, we never know. Uh, because it all, in the end, it all depends on the education of the persons and how educated they are to understand uh, um, uh, when they are going to vote, to understand what they are doing. And I, I still consider, continue to think that many people, they don't understand what they're doing when they're going to vote. That's wh why we have Donald Trump, you know, in the United States. And uh, so we never know what kind of educated education people will have by then. Hopefully they are more educated than, than, than they are now, you know. So it depends on two factors, education and on realization of benef economic benefits, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Edouard. May I may I actually add on this question because I think I, I think you have some wonderful data here. Uh, I was wondering, as you said rightly, in the cross-border regions, they will realize that it's important to keep the border open. I think this is what we can see when we have observed uh, regional actors. But how about this issue about the national governments taking a fencing approach? Um, this fear that they might do it again, and uh, also a, a kind of uh, powerlessness or uh, feelings in the border regions with local action with local political actors which could have been observed at least in the Danish German case during the lockdown uh, where do you see this this hierarchy of powers within this EU multi-level governance system how will that develop yeah that's that's why I was trying to see with education you know um, Education for me is capacity to thinking. It's not having a PhD or having, uh, you know, a more uh, academic uh, titles. It's the capacity of being able to thinking. In the end, politicians are elected by people, you know. And if you have educated people, people, people that are educated, think they realize that this uh, nationalist uh, increasing movement, um, these extremist movements that are rising in Europe, um, they need to be shut down. But the, you can only have this uh, shut down if you have people behind. Um, um, that, are, uh, um, that have this capacity to, to think, to, to realize how disadvantaged it is to support these nationalists, nationalist um, movements that are arising all across the world in, in, in Europe. So um, um, are people going to be more educated now uh, in two years from now than they are, that they are now? No, education takes a lot of time. You are a professor <laughs> and everybody that teaches in university know the most difficult thing to do is to, is to educate a person. Uh, it is difficult to do. Um, to transmit messages so that they can uh, are able to think uh, from their own mind. So it will take a lot of time um, for for people maybe to realize how fast it is this idea of shutting down borders versus o the opening of the borders. So um, Martin, um, uh, it is a fight, it is a struggle. So um, hopefully um, things are better in two years from now than than they are um, now. Uh, let's see. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. 
I have a final question, but I will, is there any other questions or something from the audience? No. Uh, I have a final question, and uh, I think it's intriguing that you've, like, the different cultural barriers, and um, and I don't remember, did you touch administrative barriers also? Is there some data on how that influences cooperation? And then finally, what is the lesson for uh, redesigning territorial policies or interreg? Or what can the yeah, EU do? Very good question. Um, no, I, I didn't use data related to these um, now different uh, administrative systems uh, in, in Europe. There's a lot of studies on that, especially from the Committee of the Region. So I didn't use this specifically data. Um, my, my, my. Um, you, you take the case of Portugal and Spain. You know, Portugal, we don't have the intercontinent. We don't have regions. Meaning, when the Spanish regions and Spain is a very regional country want to cooperate with, um, with the Portuguese region, they need to ask permission to Lisbon. Meaning, when Galicia wants to make a cooperation agreement with, with the north of Portugal, they need to ask Lisbon. And, and Lisbon, they, they, uh, if, you use the, if you use the principle of subsidiarity, which I agree, then this doesn't make any sense. So um, the, the, the logic here, in my opinion, is, is, to, is, to, to, is to support at European level and one Europe, one system, you know, in, in which uh, there is a, a strong presence of, of regions, because I, I believe in subsidiarity, you know, is uh, people at, this, at the regional level, at the local level, they know the problems better than the ones at, at the national level. So uh, I think this use of the, and I have in this, I think in this slide, if you go to the first slide, I have this in the institutional, um, uh, a common multi-level governance approach. It's this idea that, uh, you know, uh, uh, should be in, within this um, um, this concept of the global territorialist governance paradigm. It, it, you can't just govern from the national level um, issues that are related to the regional. So this is my proposal. <laughs> of course, it, it's kind of uh, utopy by now with this rising of nationalisms. Uh, but you know, uh, if you don't uh, think out of the box, then uh, nothing is changed. Okay. Thanks a lot, Edwardos. Thank um, you for this very interesting presentation on very new data and uh, asking you questions. Um, we move forward to our next keynote speaker. Uh, some years ago, we would have called him a grand old white man, but this is of course not so popular today. James Scott, professor at the University of Eastern Finland. James Scott uh, is American, but has been following cross-border cooperation in Europe for some 25 years, I think, James at least, so uh, you have really contributed a lot to this Am discipline from the very beginning. Okay. You can hear us, we can see you, wonderful. Okay, good. Uh, James has uh, been the uh, chair or director of two of the largest uh, Horizon, or well, FP6, FP7 European border region projects, uh, EU border regions and EU border scapes. Um, uh, and uh, you have contributed, well, to many, many different journals, conferences, and so on. Organized uh, Brit. The f I think you organized the first Brit, didn't you? I was one of the organizers. Oh, one of the organizers. The first Brit of this border regions and transition mm -hmm. series conf of conferences, which has um, been taking place all over the world, after all. Um, in I think we haven't also had Australia yet, but else in every on every continent. Um, you will now talk to us about the rethinking of cohesion policy. So it's a little bit of a follow-up to uh, Eduardo's presentations, but I think uh, from your abstract, which I read, it's a rather, it's, you take a diff little different perspective there. So uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank, thank you for the introduction, Martin. Um, sorry, I can't be there really. I, I have to say I'm not crazy about this kind of online format either for conferences nor for teaching, uh, but that's that's where we are at this point. And, um, okay, I'm gonna, let's share my screen, I guess. Does that work? Can everybody see that? Yes, it's fine. Okay, um, this is a thought piece um, where I'm trying to uh, contribute to the debate on, you know, where to go with territorial cooperation and cohesion policy in very trying, very challenging times. And what I'm doing here is relating issues uh, close to 
uh, questions of cohesion and um, and governance to the to to borders uh, again to borders. Um, uh, what borders do, uh, how borders are, are continue to impact on um, the way the European Union is emerging as a political community, but also in social, spatial, uh, in, in regional terms. Um, so let's see, and I move, I'm sorry, to say, huh? how do I, oh yeah, here we go. Background, um, so I'll try to not take up too much time. I wanna, I know that there's a very strict uh, schedule here. Uh, just give you some of the background of what I'm, so you understand why I'm saying why I'm, what I'm saying. Um, this is taken from a new project, actually uh, uh, an H2020 project on uh, looking at uh, spatial justice. So looking at the place-based element of cohesion policy and, and what, uh, what can we do to improve the prospects for a place-based um, uh, uh, action, place-based development, um, which of course has now become, a, I think, a very important issue within within the cohesion policy debate uh, in general. Um, and uh, one thing that occurred to me was that place is also about borders. It's very much about uh, creating a sense of, 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 of belonging, a, a sense of spatial cohesion at a local level. And that oftentimes we uh, ignore that fact when discussing the role of place. So um, this is a project that's ongoing. Actually, it will be finishing next year uh, and contributing to the debate on local stabilization strategies. Um, so generally speaking here, I'm kind of um, saying some platitudes that cohesion policy is really trying uh, to negotiate a balance between several things, uh, structural forces, uh, which are very difficult in, in fact to, to influence, economic interests of different, different groups, but also needs, social spatial needs, which are also are very multi, uh, multifaceted and regionally, uh, uh, territorially very different. Um, and we realize that just redistributing money um, you know, just spreading money is not enough to achieve a more equitable distribution of opportunities and basic amenities. And this is part, this is where the, the question of, of, of place-based development comes in. And, and since the Barker report, and I would also mention the Polish presidency in 2011, uh, uh, a great emphasis has been um, put on uh, how uh, the notion of place can be improved uh, can be strengthened within the overall policy framework. Um, and the, one of the challenges is, if, is in fact that Europe is uh, characterized by many different kinds of divisions. Div I would I argue that these are in fact borders. Uh, they are uh, spatial, they're territorial, they're cultural, they're socioeconomic. They are in a, maybe in a, in, a, in a broader sense of geographic. Uh, so I'm say, talking about metro suburban, urban rural, winner loser divides uh, are becoming politically problematic, um, and they are impacting not only on the EU as a as a community, but they're also impacting on European cohesion, um, uh, and resulting actually in bordering processes with, within Europe. Uh, Grzegorz Gorzelak already in the early 2000s was talking about the petrification of uh, territorial structures within the European Union and the, uh, based on a, a, a process of metropolization, um, of a concentration of growth in the big centers and the para peripheralization of, the, of, of crisis regions and rural, uh, rural per, per, uh, peri-rural areas. Um, the political impact of these kinds of divides, and I don't think I'm telling anybody anything, uh, anybody anything new now, um, indicate that borders, human security, but also place identity should be seen as central processes in European cohesion. And in terms of governance, we have to pay uh, greater attention to them. So just briefly, when I talk about borders, I just want to be uh, clear on what I mean. Uh, because borders are usually identified as something administrative, institutional, um, something that are, are, are formally inscribed uh, as part of uh, the nation building processes. 
as part of recognition in terms of international law. But I would argue that we, we have to think about borders, both in terms of the territorial, the traditional border, which defines state limits, as well as those kinds of borders that are much more subtle, that are existed, that, that exist within society, that are embedded within society. So social, spatial, social, cultural borders, as well as borders that emerge as the result of structural shifts, structural changes. Um, also, external, internal social political challenges to European cohesion are hard to, um, hard to disentangle. They are increasingly interwoven. Um, and I agree, and I would argue that these kinds of challenges that we are facing, the last comment was more about actual security, really. Maybe it doesn't fit into this overall debate, but that these challenges can be understood through the prism of political and social and cultural borders, uh, which means, for me at least, that uh, the discussion about place and what it means in terms of cohesion is gaining in importance. Um, the borders that I'm talking about really revolve about, uh, around questions related to inclusion and exclusion. That's a very much a bordering process. Social solidarity or the lack of social solidarity. I think COVID, the COVID-19 phenomenon is really something that shows how borders are kind of you know, jumping back uh, at us. And these borders are not only formal, but we, we see these borders in everyday life uh, because the, the, the way that people are affected by the, the uh, uh, pandemic is very different depending on, on, on their situation, their life situations. So um, uh, social questions re related to these issues and spatial justice, that is access to opportunities are becoming, becoming increasingly important. So the idea here that I'm trying to uh, market, to uh, bring across, is that uh, in terms of its governance, cohesion policy has to uh, find a better balance between innovation, which is, of course, one of the big, big ideas in, in CP, between innovation and stabilization. Um, Europe is becoming a very bordered place, characterized by divisions, contestations, and marginalization. And just to, you, just to visualize this, um, a couple of maps that I think everybody will be able to uh, relate to uh, that, that resonate with the audience, uh, that we see num numerous structural and political geographies of division uh, and hence borders uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the distribution of, of, of development, uh, the, the, the concentration of development between the, our, our uh, thriving, powerful centers and rural areas, uh, but also uh, in terms of political uh, divisions, for example, here, this on the right, and this is the, the map I, I'm really interested in, uh, showing you in rather stark terms how the uh, Brexit uh, referendum results uh, reflect clear territorial regional divisions here within the United Kingdom. Uh, for example, Scotland, Northern Ireland, nobody, nobody was for it. It was a clear remain uh, um, uh, vote. And the strongest vote here south in, in the southern part, uh, uh, south southwest uh, uh, England, um, metropolitan areas generally, uh, I mean, I'm, I got that across, uh, wrong, remain in this part, the south West London, of course, major uh, conurbations, and then in other areas, crisis regions, uh, urban, re uh, uh, rural areas, a very strong leave um, uh, uh, component. Um, let's see, move to the next one. The Polish case goes to the home. Um, in fact, I could have used the uh, later election as, a, as an example, but here the results of the uh, uh, po 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 uh, the, the presidential elections 2015, and here I mean the 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 the, the, uh, the, the Komorowski and Duda. The difference is really stark, showing Duda the dark blue and then the dark red Komorowski, where the basis of uh, support for the two fractions, you could say liberal and the national conservative, are. And it's amazing, really, this this kind of division that we can that that we see, which is also. Uh, visible in this map of Germany in its uh, uh, 2018 elections, 
uh, showing very, the, the main thing that we see here is a very stark east-west divide, but also urban-rural. Uh, and what we see here is support for the uh, uh, basically extreme right-wing party, the Alternative for Ger Germany, uh, where it's, it had its strongest uh, uh, basis of support. Um, so here in another geography of division that really is, is, is quite evident and made quite evident in, in, in these maps. Um, here again, 2019 EU elections, they um, also uh, uh, show uh, big divisions within Europe here on the left. Uh, the vote for the Rassemblement National, which is the, 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 the basically the, the extreme right wing uh, Marie, uh, Marine Le Pen's party. And here uh, the title says the vote for the RN is a vote from the periphery, uh, basically showing where the basis of support were for the extreme right. And it's clear it's really crisis regions, regions that have been losing economic dynamism and employment for, for decades and rural areas uh, versus the metropolitan areas. And in the Question in the, in, in the case of Portugal and Spain, we can see a, um, a division between conservative blue and, and, and socialist liberal red, also very clearly regionally clustered. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the regionalist parties themselves here in Catalonia and, 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 and the, the Basque country, uh, which again uh, show uh, the, the, the kind of uh, mosaic of. of, of, of regional difference of, uh, in terms of voting patterns. Maybe this is, in, to an extent, a, just a reflection of pluralism of, 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 of different, um, of different uh, uh, ideas, uh, ideologies. But the, the, uh, the starkness of the regional concentration of these voting patterns, I think, uh, does in, indeed indicate uh, that we have issues about borders within Europe. Um, now, coming back to the discussion, um, I would argue that place then, because these maps really, I think, indicate something about place. Um, sorry about that. Um, that uh, the that we can assume that the European Union, based on its documents, based on its discourse, values, place, regional identity, and unity in diversity. This has always been kind of a, of a logo. However, what does that mean in concrete terms? Um, Andres Rodriguez Poz, uh, I think in that one famous article that he published, has warned us that we find the phenomenon of places that don't matter, places that feel abandoned, that, be, that feel left behind in, 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 in the development of, of, of the, the European economy and the European political process, and that these uh, places will in fact uh, make themselves felt politically uh, and their vengeance against those who they see maybe as having marginalized them will exact a high social, political, and ultimately economic price. We're in the middle of that situation. We're in the middle of that problem that the places that don't matter are coming back uh, to, 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 to claim uh, a, a role, a sense of purpose within the, the European Union. And their voting patterns, as we just saw, um, are challenging the, the, the mainstream political consensus. Uh, why are they, why are these places rebelling, so to speak? It's a question of welfare, of job security, a sense of well-being, uh, and, and, uh, and belonging to a community, of being useful to a community, of, being, of, of having a voice that counts, and also having a positive sense of place, a place, you know, being able to positively identify with the place, your community, rather than having uh, 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 connections to a community that is stigmatized, that is seen as a bad place, that so people get the message, okay, our place is a, is, is a lousy place to live, and that means we are lousy people. This kind of problem, I think, is, is, is at the heart of, uh, of, of the, the places that don't matter, the, this phenomenon, and the reaction against that. Um, to bring in another, uh, oh, sorry, an another concept, I would agree, I would argue that ontological security could also be uh, considered in the debate. And this is really the identity of the self, 
now we see that in fact cohesion policy is getting even more complex as we if we have to take in these kinds of things into consideration uh i self-identity self-worth the ability to orient yourself in the world is, is is something that gives you a sense of security if everything is changing rapidly around you you lose a sense of proportion you lose a sense of being rooted in the world um and self-referentiality stabilizes a sense of being and provides coherence in interpreting the world. And this is, I think, is what is, uh, uh, is lacking in many areas, that disruptive change, um, lack of, pr of prospects of development are in fact eroding a sense of ontological security. So place identity is central. Um, uh, it's a challenge to a sense of, a, of community uh, there are uh, challenges to a sense of community through depopulation, loss of economic roles, rapid disruptive change. And these changes, these challenges, increase a sense of threat and political marginalization. And this, I argue, uh, I think everybody will agree here, this provides opportunities for populism and extremism. Um, if the system is not working for you, you're going to look for alternatives, uh, angry alternatives. What does this mean in terms of cohesion policy? This is kind of a, a, a tall order, I know, because cohesion policy has specific remits. It can't solve everything. It can't do everything. It's not intended to do that. It's really about trying to uh, create a sense of, of social spatial uh, uh, balance, uh, uh, social economic balance. Um, and but still, I would argue that in developing uh, uh, cohesion policy, uh, we need to take into consideration place identities and place dynamics. Um, I think if we re, if we if we interpret what and, uh, Rodriguez Poz and other critical uh, uh, observers have been writing, does that suggest that we need? a comprehensive reset of cohesion policy in terms of philosophy, organization, implementation. I would argue at least part, um, and uh, maybe a bit more uh, uh, debate, a bit more uh, reflection as to what place actually means. Um, it's not just a question of uh, so spatial socialization or the social construction of something. It really is something much more, I think, close to home uh, it's a locus for the intersubjective creation of meaning, if, I, if you understand what I mean. It's really central to uh, uh, people's identities and, orient and ways of orienting themselves in the world. And for that reason, place is very vulnerable to manipulation by the social media, by outside uh, uh, forces that are trying to create an, uh, a certain image of, of the political situation. Um, and this is something that has to be taken into consideration. We have to think in terms of sec human security, sense of, of stability and, and, and uh, 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 prospects for the future. And that is, we have to think about the relationships between individual well-being, social resilience, economic uh, uh, possibilities, environmental quality and European cohesion. So while place-based thinking is being mainstreamed, at least I'm, I hope it's being mainstreamed in the, and will continue to be important in the new programming period, uh, we really don't know very much about how we will convert this into action in terms of governance. What are the governance consequences of taking place-based development even farther uh, and, and more seriously? Um, and CP, I think one of the main issues is that cohesion policy needs to be communicated much better as an opportunity. It has to resonate locally. Um, and in some cases it does, but this is not generally the case. So coming to uh, some conclusions, and that's very easy for me to say all this from the cozy office of a, of a university in a semi-peripheral region in, 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 uh, in North uh, East Finland. Uh, but still, my, my ideas, my, my, my reflections on what this could practically mean, what I've been talking about in governance terms. 
And of course, there's no magic uh, formula for, for finding a solution. There's no magic, uh, there's no, uh, as I say, uh, uh, magic uh, formula. I would, um, but I would limit in my comments to the following, and this is also my last slide. Um, of course, addressing deep structural issues is a long-term challenge. And this requires a sustained political commitment and also a rejection of the principle of austerity, which I think has been pretty disastrous in the last 10 years. What is realistic in the short term? Okay, so here come some ideas. Maybe promote institutional learning and capacity building uh, and, and taking into consideration the differences that we find from uh, we find in different regional contexts and, and territorial contexts. We should try to or do our best to connect localities to different support and financing schemes and mobilize support ideas and energies using local knowledge more uh, efficiently. Um, and I think this is not a, a trivial thing to say, um, really getting the message down to the local level more effectively because I think a lot of the times why, CP, why, uh, why CP is not effective is because people don't know how to use it. It should be then more user-friendly in terms of co-financing initiatives to support strength and a positive, uh, positive sense of community. So uh, make these policies less cumbersome and technocratic, more accessible, target community mentoring with the help of local partners and the European Union, of course, uh, getting the message across, but also teaching network learning processes that allow communities to, 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 to learn more about what their po possibilities are, how they can use CP and, and, and other sources uh, better to achieve development goals. Um, maybe there could be a greater focus and even some more, more resources for enabling social development and social infrastructure. Uh, creating opportunities locally and also stabilizing communities, even if it's not about, you know, big job growth and innovation, stabilizing population, stabilizing communities so they don't keep, um, keep uh, uh, shrinking. Um, and then finally, uh, we have to increase our efforts to open up the conceptualization ownership and implementation of cohesion policy at the different levels, at the European and member state levels, um, maybe even to an extent, make it more democratic. That is a mouthful. And that is, again, maybe something that uh, the people in Brussels would uh, roll their eyes at because I think they're trying, they might be trying to do that themselves. Um, and here I am basically trying to uh, uh, proclaim this message from from afar, but I think, uh, I think I have said something relevant in terms of looking at uh, borders, cohesion, and, and, and its relation to governance. With that, uh, I thank you for your time, and I hope I have made my arguments more or less clear, and uh, I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I think, well, this, all, the audience here will probably agree that you have made your points clear and that is, this is very relevant. Uh, before we go into the question session, um, to our online audience, you are very welcome to ask questions too. You have this possibility within um, or give comments uh, within the YouTube transmissions. Please use it. Um, before and then, uh, our first keynote speaker, Edradosh, is now visible. So, uh, we, I would, and he would like to say thank you, like to you, with his face on the camera. So, if the uh, technic team please uh, move over to Edradosh, and James, stay there. You have to unmute. Uh, Eduardo, uh, you have to. Un uh, you're still muted. Oh. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> now, okay. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Martin. No. Um, yes, I just found out that in this new computer, I had the uh, the camera covered <laughs> for, for some reason. So uh, I now uh, uncovered. So uh, it's nice to to be here and you know, um, uh, online and be visible now. 
um, once again, thank you for the organization, for the invitation, and sorry for everything. You know, it was a problem on my old computer, my new computer. So uh, everything is fixed now, I think. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, finally, not in person, but here uh, at this conference. Yes. Likewise. I can't hear anything. Martin? Martin. We can't hear. We can't hear. <laughs> yes. Now, no. now it should be possible. Okay, yes, yeah, now yeah. I hear myself too. Sorry, I have I pressed the button too often. Um, the online audience, please use uh, the comment functions on YouTube. You're welcome to ask com questions and give comments too. Um, Thank you, James. I have a question, but I will wait until uh, the audience, uh, or I will give the first word to somebody from the audience. Uh, any issues? Uh, Hünek again? Good morning, Professor Scott. Thanks a lot for a very interesting presentation. We really enjoyed here. Let me ask you a question. You, you mentioned several points. I hope I'm audible. Uh, and you mentioned also that uh, the, so to say, uh, we should probably rethink the European uh, cohesion policy also in terms of the cross-border cooperation. In my opinion, like the DG Regio has got some limitations, which is given by the fact that it's actually the administration body, it's the body of bureaucracy in a good sense, so to say. But uh, I could have observed the last initiatives like these B solutions, which are uh, which were aimed at removing uh, cross-border obstacles from the legislative, legal, administrative point of view. Do you see any space for introducing such an initiative? within the framework of the cohesion policy, which would also strengthen, so to say, the ideational side of the cohesion policy, and which would strengthen local identity and the multi-level identity, like feeling more European. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Hunek, and sorry that I can't be there uh, at the conference. Um, I think you were the one who actually got me there in the first place. Um, that's a very good question. I think uh, uh, I think the EGTCs theoretically, potentially, uh, can help achieve this. Um, you know, in actually establishing these the legal framework for more forceful cross border cooperation and also very multi level cooperation. So linking the local with the regional with the national and as it is oftentimes, the main obstacle there is the fact that you have administrative imbalances, uh, centralized versus decentralized systems cooperating with each other. Um, and you have to agree on national frameworks and national ma uh, financial management systems uh, within a cross-border uh, uh, context. So it's, 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 a, it's a partial solution. It's a waste, it's a step forward. It's a step forward uh, if we look at the, 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 the evolution of cross-border cooperation in the last 30 years. It's not the solution, the total solution to the problem. Um, I think the, the main danger that is, uh, is uh, facing CBC is the, 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 maybe in that sense, the centralization of it. And we have to make sure that the local level maintains a strong role uh, influ influencing actorness within the process of cross-border cooperation and that the, the instruments are not, let's say, re-centralized uh, due to national government um, uh, uh, interests, um, which the opportunities would still be there to cooperate, but it would be much more uh, at the uh, according to the, 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 the ideas and the, the concepts develop it at the national level. Um, so there is the danger of retrenchment. I can't deny that. Um, on the other hand, if we take the, the, the EGTC uh, and other, let's say, elements of cross-border cooperation such that, that could be elements of cohesion policy that could be transferred to, to, to the cross-border co context, 
uh, community-led development, for example, I think we might have a gradual process of institutional change in the way that you're talking about. But I don't think there's any magic solution to it. I think CBC is here to stay. I think uh, there's too many people who have a stake in it. It's too important to drop it. The question is, will the local level, I think this is the main question, how strong will the local level uh, be represented in it in, in future? Thank you, James. We have a comment from, uh, or question from Jula Oxai from CSTI in Budapest. Um, very exciting. He, he wrote, he writes, I cite him now, very exciting presentation. There's always many things. However, I miss the historic context. The results of Polish presidential elections, not only 2015, but also 2020, more or less follow the phantom border of Germany-Poland back to 1930, well, I would say 1937. Uh, similar IFD is the strongest in the territory of the former GDR. Just have a look at the blue map. Again, the borders of the Hungarian kingdom are more or less still marked by the results of presidential elections of Romania. What do you think about this factor? Question two, centralization at EU level is identical with thematic concentration. It is understandable from the point of view of the competitiveness of the EU. However, it is, is, it not, is not it a killing factor to place-based approach? Like thematic concentration, one size fits all. What do you think about this? Okay, Jula, thanks for those two questions. Um, Number one, yes, indeed, this, the phantom border phenomenon uh, is, is interesting, and it's also something that, uh, that, that, bears, that it, is worth bearing in mind. Borders don't disappear that fast either, uh, even when they're redrawn. Um, the, the, I think Grzegorz Gorzlak also produced a very nice essay about the, 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 the legacy of um, you know, the, the divisions of, of Poland between the Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and German empires, and how that to this day influences many social spatial processes as well, uh, development processes as well as political. Um, and uh, I think, in fact, they, they, they uh, tell us that cultural processes, uh, um, uh, historical memory um, are very deeply ingrained uh, nationally. Um, that's also a reason why place, I think, is such a central question. It's, place is, is, is not something that just disappears. It has a, it, it appears and disappears. Uh, um, it, it's something that has a long history, that has a long uh, historical uh, memory. And uh, this is another issue that should be taken into consideration. And I think, yeah, you're quite right. Um, Phantom borders mean, um, mean something within Europe. And your second issue is, I think, is a well taken point. I mean, it's yeah, innovation versus um, stabilization, uh, concentration uh, in order to create a more effective policy vis a vis a more democratic, more, uh, let's say, messier uh, arrangements in terms of defining uh, the, you know, the main uh, criteria of cohesion policy, this is going to be a very difficult situation. I think one of the problems now with the new budgeting, uh, the new programming period, and I hope it does not, it, it, uh, it does not um, end in a renationalization, a recentralization of cohesion policy, because uh, then the place-based thing will become standardized. It will become, as you say, it will become mainstreamed, kind of a one size, one size fits all, um, formula which will not work. It will not work. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I, I think that, I don't think it's going to go that far. I think they're going to still maintain some uh, leeway for, for, you know, local solutions, local, uh, but the money available for these could be much less. Thank you, James. I think, Thomas, did you have a question? Thomas Sudnieski? Yeah. Uh, hello, I would like to thank you for your very interesting presentation, especially concerning the, the idea of borders, frontiers, because I've been dealing with cross-border cooperation for many years, and we, we have this idea of the, of the border as a barrier, but you gave another concept of, of the border as a psychological uh, uh, border. When I, when I saw this uh, map of Poland divided by, 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 by two, we, we, we say sometimes that we have Poland A and Poland B. And this is kind of a new, new border. And I have the question, do you have the idea how to 
soften this border because this 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 border when when it's so difficult uh, to, 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 to to deal with that that uh, one part of the fam family is re representing one option another another option so so it's, it's becoming a real problem so so do you have the idea is it difficult is it possible to soften this border or is it possible to find some 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 ideas how to solve this problem thank you um, thanks for that question. I think it's, there's no there's no short term solution. The only thing that helps is is, is discussion and dialogue. You have to link communities uh, to to avoid this sen this sense of division. And this is the problem with uh, uh, with social media and and uh, divisive political uh, for, uh, forces, which actually gain political capital and energy through division. That's how they get their, 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 their power base. They thrive on division. And, this is a, and the fact that this is a, a resource for, let's say, populist or right-wing groups is something that we have to take in consideration. These borders, I, I don't think, are permanent in the sense that they will always be marking a certain social, spatial, cultural division. These, many of these, I think, are, are, are quite recent um, the, the ones that are more based on structural uh, uh, conditions rather than these more historical borders, I think the solution is opening up this, is a more inclusive political dis debate that links up uh, very different kinds of communities, Eastern Poland with Western Poland. Not, not everybody's going to share the same values, the same ideas, but the sense that a greater sense that we inhabit the same country is something that should be on the political agenda. What, I, what more can I say? This is not a very easy question to answer. May I have a final comment or question? Um, from my experience living in a non-place or a place not to be and being uh, for five years in a local village council, um, aren't we addressing the wrong people when we blame the EU? I mean, isn't this we talk about subsidiarity but uh, when it's only possible to have funds from the eu to create some development projects because national and state development funds are more or less extinct um, uh, isn't it rather a refocus that we should think more what is has to be done at national and level, what has been about de de decentralization of national politics when we talk about uh, overcoming these centralization effects and this, this divide uh, of places and non-places? Um, yeah, Martin, I mean, I agree with you. The EU is, is like always the, the, the bad boy. Um, but the EU is made up of member states who are very powerful influencers. And it's their interests, in fact, that are being represented by the EU. So it's a cumulative process, um, a cumulative result of uh, nation state, of member state um, uh, activity, actions, and, and articulations of interests. And I, I, I think it is, you're, you're absolutely right. What we need is a more concerted, articulated uh, uh, sense of, of purpose and, and action um, be between all member states. Uh, in terms of dealing with cohesion policy, not just as, as a as a policy as such, that is, as a package of measures, but as something more comprehensive that um, involves, in fact, a lot of other uh, areas that could be complementarily used to, to bolster cohesion, um, national uh, uh, national funding, national programs, regional level funding. Um, and that the realization that they 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 do in they can and, and must fit together better, uh, I think, uh, is is an important pr prerequisite for improving the 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 functionality of the cohesion policy. Doesn't really help to just point the finger in Brussels say you guys are screwing up, because there are limits to what Brussels can actually do. So that's a good point. Okay, uh, no more questions. So thank you very much, James. We will move on to our next keynote speaker, and now thank we you. okay. We will actually uh, Alexandra Alexandros and Apostolakos from uh, uh, 
from Greece, based in, on the island of Crete, on the beautiful island of Crete. Uh, so it's again in the periphery. Um, and uh, his lecture will kind of follow up a little bit on what uh, James Scott has argued about like developing the non-places and it will be a very practical focus based on a lot of experience with smart tourism, ecological tourism, redeveloping the concept of tourism. Um, so uh, smart hospitality, smart hotels. Uh, please give us some insights on your research, how this concept may be used to create development in non-spaces, non-places. Can you well, hear us? Uh, we can hear you. Yes, Wonderful. I, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for the uh, for for the invitation. Um, to to be honest, um, listening to the the previous two presentations, uh, I thought, gosh, uh, th this is my presentation is 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 very different to to, to the previous two. I have to think of a story to to justify. Uh, my, my presentation. So the only the only story that came up to my mind was uh, um, of uh, involved uh, an American economist. Uh, he presented uh, uh, a topic uh, in a conference that was um, uh, not very relevant to his interests. So what he did, he uh, he took a pen and he stuck it uh, to his ear, and then for the remaining of his presentation, he kept the the pen. Uh, in front of him as a way to distract uh, uh, the the audience from the uh, from his presentation. Now I, I've got a pen, but I hopefully I won't have to 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 revert to to this tactics. Um, my, my presentation is, uh, as I've said, slightly different compared to the previous two. Mine is uh, slightly more theoretical on a topic which is uh, not uh, directly related uh, to um, to territorial development, but. Hopefully, you you will uh, you'll manage to uh, to find some uh, interesting pieces uh, out of out of this uh, presentation. But um, I think I, I will have to to share my screen now. Yes, I, we I'm see your sure. presentation. Wonderful. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Um, so, as I've said, uh, my name is uh, Alexandros Apostolakis. Uh, um, I am based at the Hellenic Mediterranean, Mediterranean University uh, in, uh, in Crete. Uh, my uh, presentation today is about uh, smart uh, tourism, uh, smart um, tourism systems, and how uh, these systems can uh, facilitate the development, uh, the movement towards uh, uh, sustainable tourism development. Um, just to give a very, very brief uh, background of the, um, of the things that I will be talking about today, um, the, the smart uh, system uh, context uh, is, uh, is a concept used in a variety of uh, contexts uh, and settings uh, uh, in the in the tourism and hospitality uh, sector, uh, essentially it started off. Um, we we've seen uh, the term appearing uh, in the literature um, describing smart cities, and then it gradually made its way through to to other uh, areas like uh, uh, smart destinations, uh, smart uh, hotels and hospitality, uh, smart resorts and smart uh, tourism uh, transportation systems. Um, it, uh, trying to, to provide a, a, um, a conceptual definition of the, uh, of the concept, um, the first thing we have to, uh, to note is that uh, there is no commonly agreed definition about uh, uh, what smart tourism is or what a smart tourism uh, uh, system is. Uh, instead, uh, the, the literature indicates um, um, attributes a number of um, uh, component uh, parts, a number of, uh, um, of, of features, of, um, of layers uh, that uh, comprise uh, a uh, smart uh, tourism uh, system. The first component part, uh, and the one that uh, we have um, observed in the lit literature um, earlier, 
relates to the the physical uh, infrastructure that's available within uh, uh, within the destination. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, the way that uh, buildings, uh, man-made uh, monuments, uh, transportation infrastructure, or even uh, uh, cultural artifacts um, uh, interrelate or try to connect uh, with uh, the visitor, with the, the user. Uh, so, for example, we've got uh, systems in place in museums that uh, indicate to potential visitors when is the best time to visit uh, an exhibit or, or a museum. The, um, then there is the, um, uh, the, the technology uh, component or the technology layer. This is essentially the most popular um, conceptual aspect of the, of the smart system. Uh, which in essence uh, describes all the uh, the systems, uh, uh, mobile applications, uh, beacon systems, uh, Wi-Fi systems uh, that um, destinations are um, putting in place to communicate with their visitors. Uh, for example, we've got uh, a number of uh, destinations that are describing themselves these days as um, as, as smart cities um, um, due to the uh, uh, to the Wi-Fi network that they install uh, in the city center to allow visitors and uh, and, and the local population to uh, to engage with each other. Then there is the the data component, the data layer, which essentially uh, relates to the availability of data, uh, how we deal with the data, how we collect and share data. Uh, that allow us to um, uh, to uh, to make decisions. Uh, that allows us to to reach to certain uh, uh, decisions based on, on on the availability of that data. Um, to to give you a very very uh, topical example of uh, the uh, the the significance of this component uh, in in Greece uh, at the moment they are talking about. Uh, um, the concept of uh, smart lockdowns. Uh, and essentially what they're trying to do, they're trying to uh, lock down specific uh, areas within geographical context, not the whole area, not the whole geographical location, but rather the, the specific location where the majority of uh, COVID-19 incidents uh, have been aggregated. And, and, and this decision-making, which obviously has an impact on tourism as well. And this level of decision-making is only available through the existence of data and the ability to, uh, to manipulate the data and, uh, and, and make decisions, uh, support decision-making on the basis of that data. Uh, the, the penultimate um, component part of a smart uh, system is uh, the business layer, which relates to the um, the interconnection essentially of uh, different systems, different business systems uh, with each other. And essentially this relates mostly to, um, to, um, to, to, to businesses and uh, business stakeholders within the, uh, um, the tourism, uh, within the tourism context, the tourism industry. And finally, we've got the, the experience component, the user experience component, which is uh, the latest uh, element, the latest feature of a tourism, of a smart uh, system, a smart tourism system that has emerged in the literature and essentially um, discusses and describes all the ways that uh, um, a visitor, a user, a tourist uh, is... Uh, uh, connecting with uh, other uh, tourists, uh, with local population, uh, in order to co-create uh, um, his or her tourism experience. So essentially, all these, uh, all these uh, different layers, all these different uh, concepts, make up the, uh, the smart uh, tourism system. Um, in terms of the the drivers. Um, uh, that have given rise to uh, smart uh, tourism systems. Uh, the literature has identified six basic categories, uh, six basic drivers uh, for the emergence of these, uh, of these uh, systems. Um, we've got the, the customer satisfaction driver, essentially um, tourism entrepreneurs, tourism uh, firms who want to, uh, to build uh, 
um, customer loyalty. They, they want to, to maximize customer satisfaction. So they are using uh, smart systems uh, to that end, to that, uh, to that purpose. Um, another driver relates to customer personalization. Uh, the fact that um, uh, as in almost all other cases, uh, um, firms need to individualize, to, to customize their product as much as possible because out of this customize, customization, they will be able to extract a greater uh, added value from their product or their service. Then it is the, the element of uh, interconnectivity and uh, interactivity, which essentially uh, argues that uh, uh, information communication technology and technological innovations would uh, give uh, an incentive uh, to, uh, to tourists to create their own experiences through interaction and uh, uh, interconnection with, uh, with other users, other consumers, uh, and other stakeholders. Um, We've got the, the financial and the cost or the cost uh, driver. Uh, and the argument here is that uh, smart systems would make the operation uh, in, the, in the tourism sector, the, the, the value chain in the tourism sector to, uh, to operate uh, more efficiently and uh, with lower costs. So leading to, to cost reductions. Uh, very importantly, a very important factor is the environment. Um, um, long ago, the, the literature and, uh, and researchers have uh, identified the significance of uh, changing uh, consumer preferences regarding the environment. Uh, uh, we have realized how significant the, the environment is for uh, um, the decision, the tourists' decision making. So um, they have tried, they have started to, to utilize smart systems towards uh, environmental protection. And, and the final driver, which is equally significant, of course, is uh, relates to, to competitive pressures within the tourism sector. Um, the, um, the, the, the smart systems, the utilization of uh, smart systems uh, uh, would allow um, businesses uh, uh, greater autonomy and uh, would mitigate uh, intermediaries uh, role in the, in, the, in the value chain. Um, just yeah, grammatically, I'm just uh, I'm illustrating the significance of each one of these uh, drivers uh, in the literature. As you can see, uh, environmental awareness as well as competitiveness, uh, competitive pressures uh, seem to be at the forefront, uh, seem to be the most significant drivers behind the emergence, behind the development of, of these uh, um, smart uh, tourism systems. Um, what is also interesting, and, and this is quite important, this slide is quite important for the, for the remaining of my uh, presentation, uh, is uh, the, um, the, the path that we have taken um, to reach to, to where we are at, uh, right now. Um, as you can see from this, uh, from this slide, there are three I have identified, or rather the literature has identified three distinctive um, uh, periods. Uh, the literature is calling them three um, uh, disruption stages in the, um, in the tourism industry. Uh, the first wave or the first uh, disruption in the tourism industry occurred uh, back in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, when we first attempted to automate the um, uh, the, the, the tourism industry through the introduction of the uh, first um, uh, reservation systems. Um, then uh, back in the mid 80s, beginning of 90s, we've got the emergence of e-tourism, uh, which is essentially, uh, it is the, the integration of uh, uh, the information technology in the tourism uh, sector. Uh, and this is uh, actually this is the period when uh, we we see the uh, the major disruption in value chain taking place through the elimination of the intermediaries uh, from the uh, from the from the value chain. 
And uh, the, the third uh, wave of disruption, the stage that we are at the moment, uh, the third wave of, uh, of disruption uh, relates to the, uh, to the greater integration of uh, systems within the, the tourism sector, within the tourism industry, uh, which essentially is due to the, the, the embeddedness of um, uh, ICT into the, the tourism product. So essentially the first two stages, the first two disruption stages in this process related to the, uh, to the value chain within the, the tourism sector, within the tourism industry, whereas the third uh, disruption stage, the stage that we're um, at this moment uh, relates to the actual product uh, per se. Uh, and, and in essence, uh, um, this, this period, this stage of disruption is essentially the stage where um, ICT is, is integrating even more with the product in order to enrich the, uh, the user experience. Now, at the, at the top uh, right-hand uh, corner of my presentation, there is a question mark indicating the fourth uh, uh, stage of disruption in as far as the the tourism uh, smart tourism systems are concerned. This is a where I'd like to end up with. So if you would be kind enough to to bear up with me for a little bit longer, and this is where we are going to end up uh, uh, eventually. Um, moving on now into the into the sustainability debate. Um, so far, we have talked about the. Uh, the influence of the uh, smart systems. Moving on into the sustainability debate, um, I think it would be fair to say that all tourism destinations, either mature or developing uh, tourism destinations, are essentially facing um, uh, some common problems. They, uh, they face uh, uh, some sustainability uh, issues. Um, it would be fair to say again that the majority of tourism destinations um, or the problems that the majority of uh, tourism destinations are facing are or could be summarized under the headings of environmental sustainability uh, that relates to the degradation of uh, natural resources, the over-exploitation of natural resources, uh, and uh, greater congestion that takes place due to the concentration of tourism activity within certain uh, uh, time frames. There are economic problems uh, relating to economic sustainability due to um, the, the oligopolistic powers that uh, uh, intermediaries, uh, the suppliers uh, uh, may have acquired uh, over the years. And essentially we're talking about the, uh, the bargaining power that uh, two operators uh, exercise on uh, individual tourism destinations. And of course, the fact that uh, there is an even greater number of, uh, uh, of uh, firms uh, and uh, destinations entering the market uh, every day. And finally, there is an element of, of social sustainability, social problems um, for um, tourism destinations relating to the authenticity of the tourism experience and the, uh, the conditions prevailing uh, uh, in the local economy, in the local community as a result of, of, of tourism activity. Um, in, in my case, for the research I'm doing, uh, the, the area that I'm concentrating on, um, the uh, sustainability issues relates to the first two uh, uh, problems, so the environmental and the economic sustainability. So um, uh, the, 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 the focus of my discussion, if you like, relates uh, specifically to those two uh, elements of sustainability, environmental and, uh, and economic. So um, we have to identify now, at least the, 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 the literature has identified uh, a set of uh, different ways, four different ways through which uh, smart uh, tourism systems could facilitate um, greater sustainability uh, for tourism destinations. Um, may I, firstly, may I shortly yes. interrupt you? You have three more minutes. Three more minutes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right. I'll hurry up then. Um, 
Um, first, the first reason is that uh, smart systems uh, would allow uh, uh, firms to extend their product. Uh, they would uh, give them the ability to create more, uh, more products and more services. And uh, they would also give them the opportunity to, um, uh, to differentiate their product uh, according to individual needs, according to individual requirements, according to uh, individual preferences. Uh, that's the first, uh, the first, um, uh, first point. Second point is that uh, um, smart systems uh, uh, offer an advantage to mass tourism providers, uh, essentially because uh, they represent uh, a fixed cost investment. Um, for fixed cost investments, the greater the, the size of your market, uh, the better you are able to, to cope with this investment, the, the cost of that investment. So for mass tourism destinations, the bigger you are, the, the better equipped you are to deal with that investment. And, and finally, um, because of this, uh, of this uh, high fixed cost, uh, smart systems could uh, operate as uh, uh, barriers to entry for new firms. The problem lies in the fact that um, uh, a lot of tourism providers do not realize that uh, um, tourism is a year-round activity. This means that uh, um, we have to cater for these tourists uh, that are virtually visiting our place, our destination, all year round, not just for the, 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 the summer season. And I think because I would like to, to cover the next slide a little bit more detail, I'm going to skip through the, the next, and I'm going to go to the final point to customer and visitor preferences. Um, I think the, the gap in the literature, and this is where my contribution is into the discussion, my, um, I think that there's a gap at the moment as far as the uh, uh, examination or the elicitation of individual preferences are related. Um, the literature is debating quite a lot about conceptual definitions of smart tourism systems, uh, talks about, uh, talks in great detail about the, the adoption patterns of different smart systems in tourism, but they are paying lip service towards the elicitation of preferences uh, about the features, the particular features of a tourism, of a smart tourism system that should be introduced. Considering the, um, the, the, the cost of investing in uh, acquiring, installing all these system, systems, it makes sense not only to identify um, which particular feature, which particular component part would give greater value to, um, uh, to users, but also identify within particular segments, within particular uh, uh, demand um, uh, goods, uh, which are the features? Which are the features uh, that uh, provide the the greatest uh, added uh, value? And so, in order to conclude my presentation, my argument is that uh, um, we should be moving one further step, one further ahead from the third uh, wave of disruption. Uh, we should be moving to the fourth. We should be anticipating the fourth. Uh, wave of disruption in the in the tourism uh, um, system uh, through the uh, elicitation, the accurate elicitation of uh, of individual preferences as far as these uh, uh, smart systems. Uh, we need to identify very accurately uh, what are these uh, component parts that visitors actually like, prefer. And also, we have to identify within particular demand segments uh, which of these systems uh, carry the, the, the more weight, the, the more added value uh, for them. And this is, to, to, to my rationale, the, uh, the path for, the, uh, for accomplishing uh, even greater uh, competitive advantage through uh, smart systems within the, uh, within the tourism and, and hospitality sector. Right. I, I hope that it didn't bore you that much with my presentation. Thank you very much again, and I welcome any of your questions. Thank you, Alan Sanders. Let's give, him, let's give all the presenters a hand of the session. Uh, Alexander, I don't, uh, this is an interdisciplinary approach in the conference, so your presentation has been very enriching for me, who have not worked on this at all, and I assume also for the audience, and I think it is a very good follow-up 
to the first, uh, to the two introductory keywords and showing what can actually be done, what can we do in practice to promote regions in a modern way with sustainability in mind, uh, SDG and all these agendas down on the local level. Going back to Gruhal and Brundtland, think global, act local. Uh, okay, questions from the audience. Well, you had one last chance. I will take you a second, Thomas. Um, sorry, I forget your name. Lukas. Lukas. Thomas, also Thomas from, from uh, Poznan. So this camera, okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, your presentation is very was very interesting and uh, very detailed, although theoretical. So um, I have a question because, uh, especially people who are geographers or regionalists, are often are talking about regional sustainable development. So. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the role of smart tourist systems or smart or just, uh, as you name it, uh, sustainable tourist development in regional or local uh, sustainable development? Right. But uh, I think um, in, in my context, uh, the, um, the, the area that I'm focusing on um, tourism is uh, one of the uh, primary economic activities. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, Crete uh, is experiencing all the symptoms um, related to, to tourism, mass tourism activity. And there is a long debate, probably 10 years, 15 years old debate about whether what kind of tourism we, we want uh, whether we want to carry on with the existing model or whether we want to go into a sustainable tourism uh, development pathway. And, and to me, to my mind, I think this debate is void. There is no point in debating this. Um, mass tourism is perfectly fine as far as certain uh, conditions and certain restrictions are in place. And uh, to relate this to, with, to, to my presentation, I think uh, smart systems is, um, smart tourism is an excellent way to, to take advantage of, of your size, of your scale of operations, uh, and at the same time try to make it, mitigate as much uh, um, of the negative side effects of, of, of tourism activity. So I think that um, mass tourism activity can coexist with sustainable development uh, as long as certain conditions uh, are, are met. And I think that these smart systems uh, is doing this, uh, could do this, this job. OK, thank you. Uh, and uh, Tomasz Tudniewski from Gdansk. Hello, I would like to thank you very much for a nice presentation, especially I am very glad that you could uh, uh, take this, the sustainability issues to the concept of smart destination. And I, I was trying to be a sustainable tourism a few years ago when I visited Greece. Everyone went to Athens and I decided to, to visit a small sustainable destination called Mati. And I, I wanted, I wanted to everyone to, to, to say, oh, it's such a nice place. And I was so sorry when, when there was this, this fire. And I still believe that it will be the opportunity because that was the perfect example of small, unknown, sustainable destination. But what I would like, like to raise, I think that your, your concept, your model of this multi-layer multi uh, uh, smart destination, smart tourism is very interesting. But frankly speaking, I, I missed one thing. I think that according to uh, EU recommendations on sustainable tourism, maybe it would be advisable to think how to combine this, this idea of multi-layer uh, smart tourism with the idea of multi-stakeholder multi uh, uh, approach because I think that it's very important when, when we think about smart destinations, smart tourism, uh, uh, to ask, okay, smart, but, but, but 
for whom? For tourists, for, for, for the business. And I think that we should uh, think a little bit more about local community and to find a way that it will be also smart for local community. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, I think um, one of the, um, aside this issue of, of, of preferences, I think uh, one other thing that the literature has not um, has not uh, touched yet is this issue of, of the local community. And uh, I'm glad that you have raised this because I have also read, uh, recently read another piece uh, from, uh, from another researcher arguing the case um, of uh, the local communities and how they react to smart systems. How do they engage with smart tourism systems? So from that, uh, from that perspective, I, I, I fully acknowledge your point and you are spot on as far as your, your observation is concerned. Okay, thanks everybody. Is there another question, something from the audience? No, thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping the time frame. We are exactly on time for the 11.00 coffee break. Um, we will start again at 11.15. I know that coffee breaks are important to socialize, to develop <laughs> ideas and so on. But please, the live audience, be back here at 11.15 sharp so we can continue to be within our time frame. Thanks to everybody for this first session in the morning.
etapowo. Tak? A teraz? No teraz jest OK. Good morning. Good morning, professor, professors. Can you hear us? We want to check our connection, our sounds and your voice and your camera. Is everything okay for you? Can you hear us without any noises and any disruptions? Hi, Hi I can hear you. Oh, great, wonderful. Can you tell us something for us? What? Can you tell us something for us, maybe louder or... Because we want to test your voice here in our room.
and they do not have as good cake as we have, I assume. So we're moving on uh, with uh, our next session of keynote speakers with uh, three distinguished speakers who will take us into three uh, different fields which are all follow I think all following up on the uh, introductory keynote lectures our first uh, keynote speaker is in this se in this session is uh, professor Jacinto Garrido Velarde from the University of Extremadura in Spain he has been working on ecosystems applied in Euro cities, so both on the sustainable development side, but also on the cross-border cooperation, Euro city, uh, city urban cooperation policies. And uh, he will uh, look at, uh, give us some impressions or look into this field of landscape and construction. Like how do we design our cities, our towns to make them more sustainable and more development, sustainable development goal oriented uh, to have a more sustainable future in urban life, if I understood you right. Uh, I give the word to Professor Jacinto Velarde, please. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank WS uh, B University for its invitation to participate in the Congress, and also thank Professor Joanna for her effort to make the Congress possible. I will have liked to be with you in Poland, but the COVID doesn't allow us to move. Okay. My presentation is titled Manager of Territory and environmental sustainability, the landscape and construction set from an integrative perspective. Okay, okay. So, a landscape represents one of the main able resources and they are not renovable. One solution is the integration of building with the rural landscape, basing on the visual relation between this surrounding with environment. The conducted study by several authors verified the use of vegetation increasing the integration of construction with the landscape. The vegetation. The elements with define the purpose still landscape are dominated visual elements of the landscape. So the visual aspect of any object in this particular case of isolated building in the rural environment could be defined by their color, textures, line, and shape, as well by the reference to the composition of the scenery, like scale and space, two three-dimensional scenarios. Filtering of the part of the vegetation of the superficial properties and the element of formation of the building can improve the perception of these visual elements. In the second analysis, the relative position of vegetation regarding the building may affect the element of composition of Spain and scale. The use of vegetation to reduce the visual impact of construction with the rural landscape is used by planner and other landscape designers. The election of the species to use depends on the characteristics of the filtering of the crowd canopy. The paper of author like Rees and other author estimate the capture of the life of the ground for several tree species. The amount of the life with the foliage of the tree cultures can be related to the coefficient of filtering of the growth by a species. And maybe, and maybe, sorry, apply the landscape study 
also no reference has been found. The verification screen proposed till today can be divided in two. A screen complete uh, heading and a screen of partial heading. Lewis highlights the possibility of complete covering of the building by means of vegetation screen. The screen of complete hiding of characteristics because the length of the interposed vegetation barrier is bigger than the length of the building to cover. Using a species of different height uh, and aspect to stain instead of serve screen. The setup will be made and we to both covering will be obtained while using two lines with alternative basis or a species with different aspect with the complete this covering. On the other hand, vegetation has not always been studied in an explicit way, but in directive way through relative concept with this as known as the, as the mystery. Mystery, this is the concept is understood as the extent to which person who observing can obtain more information about the landscape. It could be entered within. TV included the vegetation element and related it directly to be mystery concept, a attribute to take into account of the visual scale of the one who observed the landscape. The screen of partial covering gives a result of variation of visual characteristics of the building. In a way, the safe line or the superficial property of this can be seen modified by the vegetation and produce of better integration with its surrounding. Some planners and architectures uh, acknowledge the value of important presentation to the respond and evaluate to propose to work. Throw urban design much before it was technical possible. Cleaning plan can also be used to the facade of the construction to obtain partial covering and the obtained results could be related to the landscape study although no reference can be formed. The relative position of the vegetation of the tree toward the construction all need to be taken account. If the tree is located behind or, behind or next to the construction, they modify the scenic background and the scale perception of the construction. If the tree is located in front of the construction, they add the vegetation screen. Okay, the main purpose of this study is to research the integration of the construction with the landscape showing a scenario in three dimensions through a video and a study skill that allow a great public participation. Uh, for this study, uh, selected two experimental areas, one representative of area uh, rural environment, which is the valley and broad in the north of Cáceres and the second area in the south of Huelva, corresponding to the littoral environment. We proceed the selecting different parcel, okay, different parcel, the study and model the status quo of the same. The three elements were designed with the SketchUp software which allowed to us locate the design element with the program that was used to generate it video. With the modelized scenario, the screen vegetation is located around the type of vegetation of the type of construction, changing its density, species, and disposal. For the scenario in the north of Extremadura, a uh, Mrs. Foren was designed with oak and chestnut trees at the most representative species for the studies part. With this scenario, construction typical of these surrounding are also modelized around with vegetation screen and located with different densities, species, and the disposal. One of the scenarios has established the generic video with different speed simulating 
tourist activity which can be outdoor. The capital letter is represent an outdoor activity, the result of the total of nine videos. The slide and the this minimum cost according to the number of simulations. Okay, now I share with you uh, the videos. Okay, for the study area of the Superhuelva, a pine forest has been designed as the more representative species of the study park. This scenario also modelized a typical construction, you can see in the video, around with vegetation screen with different densities, species, and dispersal are located. In the other scenario, the videos uh, are in the north of Extremadura, modelized the chestnut and uh, oak. The video for both simulation scenarios always run the same distance, where only the speed change, and likewise time and duration of the video. Now I continue with the presentation Okay a uh, final study will review the night video per person what reviewed previously and this result to be ecstasy from the point of view of the tiredness of the respondents. For this, the total number of answers surveyed per study area had been three. To complete the matrix design in each survey, three different videos had been presented according to the color of the cell which can be observed with the next graphic. This allows is to divide the design maximizing the variable of the presented case according to the study variable, minimizing the visual strength by the respondents. With the main selection of the survey, the respondent will indicate the evaluation about the practice of outdoor tourist activity in three of the proposed routes according to the sequence of random videos assigning to the interview interview person. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. With the mice. Resume and discussion. In this phase, then result from the survey with analyze. In this phase, analyze 169 uh, survey. For the location of Huelva, the data analyzed through ANOVA has resulted the significant only density factor. This indicates that neither the type of vegetation or the speed of the moving passing by the itinerary of the type of the associated activity has showing importance for the evaluation of the video. Only the covering of the building with vegetation has had a positive effect, and this moreover doesn't seem to have relation with the position of the same, meaning that it doesn't matter if the screen is regular or irregular. The comparison of the analysis showed that the high irregular density had the same accepted as the high linear density. 
The opposite occurs with the low density, which is part of the category with a density element that has results significantly both evaluated. From the analysis of the obtaining result of the open response, we extract have the, the main purpose of this work. We have sent to work properly is the level of presented photo reality. Also, large part of the responding could improve the quality of the video. Another large percentage of the people wouldn't change anything despite detecting that the video are sample. We did it without the necessity of the large realist. The proposed video has served to find significant difference with the analysis of the approach question at the main purpose of this study. For the location of the north of Extremadura, the answer to ATO 84 survey had been analyzed. The result of the ANOVA are similar to the obtaining result for the location of Huelva, saying again only the density is the one with the significant, significant wave of the evaluation of the scenario. Again, the possible comparison of the analysis also so that the high, high irregular density have the same acceptation of the high linear density. The opposite of form with the low density, which is the far the category with the density element with the results significantly worse evaluated. Regarding the final question, again, this doesn't change nothing or increasing the quality of the video which are predominant. However, in this case, in the north of Tremadura, the rate had been reversed, being the large number of cases with having changing of all. Therefore, the result of obtained for the case of Huelva could indicate that the video had been perfect Asia. Also, in any case, in both areas, the simulation seemed to be the know of the proposed study. Conclusions. The proposed method had proved to be now consist and easy to use to recommend its use in the world with similar aim from the perspective of the landscape planning. The use of 3D modeling seemed to be a useful tool to facilitate the integration of building in the landscape. In the scenario of the North Extremadura and South of Huelva, of all the varying vegetation screen plays around the building, the world with highest score in the high density wherever it's laid out. The use of vegetation improved the integration of the building in the landscape in the fact of the conserving of the, this building had been relatively highly in the analysis of the result obtained in this study. For finally, I go to expose some future research line to continue and complete the result of this work. Depend the 3D modeling of the type of plant species common uses to mitigate the visual impact of the building in the rural area. And generate an interactive virtual environment that allows respect to modify the modeling scenario and different elements. Addition, allowing them to freely navigate inside the modeling space. Thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, is Sam found any question? Thank you, Jacinto, very much for this uh, illustration, how, in principle, very simple measures enacted locally can help us in moving forward with can help us in moving forward with uh, uh, development, sustainable solutions and uh, reactions to climate change and all these challenges we face in regions that are sometimes very peripheral. And, can, and there, I mean, I think your empirics have shown very well how, how uh, they can make a place more attractive and uh, perhaps then also change this mentality, like what James Scott was talking about, of non-place becoming a place where you can be proud of. Here we have done something good for this region. Um, questions from the audience? 
Yes, uh, Wojciech Opciola. Where should I go there? Yes. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, it's here. Hello, Professor. Hi. I'm visible, yes. Thank you for this um, interesting uh, lecture. Um, I would like to ask, it is just the research or it is, it is kind of um, first step to, the, to some local or regional policy in Extremadura or, he or uh, Huelva is the second region. So will you introduce this, this idea um, in fact or it's just still a, a, a research? Okay, uh, this, this study is uh, to improve the, the integration of the building in the middle of the countryside. In Spain, uh, the law uh, around to the construction uh, in the middle of the landscape uh, is, is wrong. Uh, you can uh, construction in the middle of, of the, the landscape and any technical uh, advice. Uh, this is a one solution in the real problem in, in Spain, in all Spain, uh, where are uh, a lot of construction in the middle of the countryside. Uh, one solution is integration of this building in the middle of the countryside, use of vegetation that mitigate the impact uh, the this construction uh, uh, in, in his surrounding. Uh, one more from uh, Andrzej Jakubowski from um, from uh, Lublin. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Um, it's, um, we all agree that existing planning tools and uh, legal arrangements are not very sufficient with the protection of beauty of la landscape. And I just would like to ask you um, about the, how we may change the existing situation, whether you propose some soft promotion of a good, uh, uh, good examples, good, uh, uh, good practices, or we need a change in our legal system and in our planning system to preserve uh, uh, landscape and to preserve uh, uh, heritage of uh, rural areas. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, this is a, a, a great opportunity for the uh, rural area. It's possible. Uh, construction in, in, in the middle of the countryside is the law is, is allowed. Uh, this is a, a, a good solution uh, to construction in the middle of the countryside uh, by legal that uh, uh, with uh, technical advice that used to construction for uh, architecture and landscape design. Uh, the law uh, in Spain only uh, allow uh, construction in uh, urban uh, or next to urban. No allowed to construction in the middle of the countryside. One solution is integration this building in the middle of the countryside and in, uh, even uh, allow in new law uh, the construction in the middle of the countryside, but technical advice. For example, use of vegetation, uh, the construction uh, in the middle of the landscape, no uh, construction of uh, uh, new uh, urban uh, or new town in the middle of the countryside. Okay. More questions from the... Oh, yes, please. From uh, Professor Zalewski, uh, UTP uh, in, uh, in Bukos. Bud uh, I have one question. Uh, uh, how many people you use in uh, each uh, survey? Because in my opinion, uh, number of uh, analyzed uh, survey can influence into statistical results. Okay. Uh, during my presentation, I, I don't know uh, to explain uh, the, the matrix of design of the survey. 
for this study, I use a Latin square. Okay, Latin square is a technical to analyze a three variable uh, in one case. Uh, this, this methodology is accepted for the uh, scientific uh, community and uh, they use uh, this technical Latin square in other study in, in other area, uh, for example, in, in agro system, in socioeconomic, etc. Uh, you use uh, the Latin square is possible if with the 100, uh, 200 survey, you uh, get a significant result uh, by analyze by ANOVA or post-hoc. If you are interested in this methodology, uh, you can send me an email, okay? Uh, and you send uh, several studies with this methodology uh, uh, published in uh, uh, research journal. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Professor, oh, you can introduce yes. yourself, I guess it's easiest. Professor Gold from uh, John Stoffer. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your presentation. It was quite, quite interesting. Uh, however, I would like to know the results, the real results, because uh, all the times we are having very nice ideas, uh, very useful ideas. Uh, but what is the interest of uh, policy makers, decision makers in your research and introduction of uh, generally sustainability ideas in landscape uh, creation and so on? So I would like to know what is the real situation of the interest in your country from, uh, in relation to your, to your research. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you for your question. Uh, the, the, the study of, of the result uh, always uh, advised to uh, architectures, uh, landscape architectures, uh, even for administration. Uh, even these, these studies is published uh, in, in journal, scientific journal, uh, in concrete, this study has been for 1,000 people that uh, I, uh, the, the different position between uh, the study research with the administration. The administration, uh, this is the politic uh, people that uh, make the law and uh, no, always the research study is uh, joined to uh, the law. In concrete, in Spain, I train to present the study to administration and the new uh, project to incorporate the research in the uh, public administration. Even there are uh, uh, the uh, resort, tourist resort. In Spain, in the north uh, of Extremadura, the island of Paldecaña, they use some methodology to integrate the construction uh, in the middle uh, of the countryside. This is uh, uh, our report to the uh, light public. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh I can see no more questions here. Do we have any from the online audience? Uh, not either. So thanks, thank you a lot, Professor Jacinto Velarde, for your presentation and for the discussion. Um, we move on to the next presenter, which is uh, Associate Professor Marina Andieva from the University American College in Skopje in North Macedonia. Um, she has, uh, is a political scientist who has been working on regional autonomy governance issues, uh, minorities, local self-government, and uh, will we go moving to a very different topic now, but also very relevant when we think about borders and uh, regional development, diversity management. How can we include national minorities into regional development policies? 
Marina, are you with us? Yes, we can see yeah, you. I'm, I'm trying to, to share my presentation. We can hear you. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, Perfect. yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, go I'm ahead. just trying to share my presentation. Should I share a screen or there is uh, a yes. yes, it's coming. Okay, perfect. Yes, it's there. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it was it is really a pleasure for me to be part of uh, your international. Uh, uh, conference, uh, which actually uh, tackles many important uh, uh, important issues in today's world, and that is uh, the concept of borders, of territorial governance, and development in terms of uh, uh, territorial heritage, cultural, and environmental uh, issues. My uh, presentation, my intervention today, uh, contribution to the conference is. Uh, uh, slightly different from uh, Professor uh, Jacinto that uh, uh, explained and was the previous key, uh, keynote speaker and tackles uh, not a result of a research per se, but uh, a sort of an analytical tool that it could be used in order for uh, us to uh, ask the main question of my intervention and that is whether and to what extent minorities, ethnicities, ethnic groups, linguistic groups are involved in uh, cross-border cooperation initiatives and what is their position in the, uh, in the border, in the border regions. So what I would like to, you know, ask uh, uh, with my presentation and of course to trigger thoughts among you participants is a couple of questions is, the first one is how borders influence minorities' life and rights, whether they have a positive or a negative effect and impact on them uh, how legal and political arrangements influence minority protection, apart from borders as, a, as one impact factor. How cross-border cooperation can be used uh, as an instrument to foster legal, uh, legal measures protecting the rights of, uh, of minorities and are essentially minorities involved in cross-border cooperation and how they can be. What are the possible involvement, depending of course of the border region system, but also what, what could be uh, the, the check boxes that one can really check and see whether it, there is a possibility for minorities to, uh, to be involved. Uh, of course, before, uh, before I start, uh, there are a couple of terms that I use uh, and they, they are quite similar uh, metaphors sometimes and synonyms for uh, for one terminology, which is the border as such, because um, as you all know, uh, territoriality is something that classifies one state, one territory, one community, one social organization. It is a territory that actually helps communicate different uh, subjects uh, from both sides of the border or from three sides of the border. And it is the territoriality that controls the overall power, political, social, legal power of one, uh, one nation, if I can say, or one uh, sociological organization. Uh, of course, uh, there are three main terminologies that are used, and that is boundary, of course, frontiers, and border. These are uh, terminologies that are used in the past, and I guess you are all familiar that these are synonyms, uh, but also uh, these are uh, terms that are used and that are quite different uh, from, uh, from each other. For example, um, uh, are, the frontier can be just a settlement or from a large, uh, large country such as United States of America or Australia where we have a landscape which is a pretty much different from what we know as European frontiers. Or political frontiers are also those that uh, in previous centuries, times, uh, enlightened or limited kingdoms and uh, entire empires. Of course, uh, lawyers, political scientists have uh, uh, linked uh, frontiers with territorial boundaries, boundaries that actually 
give uh, significant uh, power or uh, leave states to exercise authority and power uh, sovereignty over a certain uh, area, area of time. Um, through the, of course, 19th century and at the beginning of, of, of 20th century, we have uh, the imagined community of Benedict Anderson, where we link territory with na nation, nationalism, nation states, national, national boundaries. And here we have uh, first, uh, 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 let's say, an in introduction to what is called ethnicity, multinationality, uh, notion of culture and society, how they interact uh, uh, together and how they uh, enhance uh, the territory where they actually live and reside and cherish uh, with the cultural heritage, with languages, with religion, and with uh, habits and customs. In this sense, uh, of course, we see borders, frontiers, uh, borders as, uh, uh, as a mere function that they exercise, and uh, they exercise the function of keeping together these diversities and increasing the substances of identities. This being said, of course, uh, there is uh, uh, an impact of the dividing diversities in uh, three types of consequences or three types of, of, of situations that we can encounter. The first one, of course, is block of inter-system relations where we have a situation where diversities are not uh, the focus of our, uh, of our interest, that uh, two states or more than two states have blocked their uh, inter uh, territorial uh, relations or inter-system relations and uh, the concentrations is over a centralized system. The second type is open relations which uh, do not undermine essential integrity, meaning that there is not a full integration uh, in terms of di diversities, in, th in terms of cultures. And the third one is, uh, let's say, the most positive, the most uh, optimistic uh, situation is where we have differentiated relationships and integration between two or more systems, meaning that we have an exchange, an open border, uh, where cultural heritage, identities, uh, uh, landscapes can uh, communicate between each other and they can share easily by the support of the state their, uh, uh, their history and their, uh, their relations. Uh, this being said, uh, of course, when uh, I analyze and when I propose as an analytic, analytical tool for those that are interested in this issue to analyze the position of the minorities, we have this spectrum of uh, four different scenarios or four different uh, border areas that can be identified. The first one is where we have a frontier a frontier uh, which is a, a border which is mobile and it's open uh, and where the position of the minorities is actually uh, uh, somehow different from the rest of, and I'm going to tackle each one of them, but I just need for you to explain these four uh, quadrants that uh, you have in, in front of you and I hope you can see them very well. Um, so the first, of course, is you have a frontier, you have a large territory, uh, such as uh, uh, the frontiers within Australia, large continent, continents, uh, frontiers uh, uh, between the United States of America, where you have mobile, uh, mobile uh, uh, movements uh, when uh, borders are open within uh, certain systems, state systems, such as federalism, for example. The second one is where the border is static, it is firm, uh, but it's still open, so there is still cooperation. And uh, because of the staticness, let's say, if I can uh, express in English this, if, if this exists as a term, uh, because of the nature of the border of a static, we have a situation where the border between one or two or three uh, uh, states, countries, uh, now becomes the center of uh, cooperation. It becomes of the focal point uh, as you can see, the, the narrow goes from the center to the, to the periphery. P is a periphery, C is a center. So it, it, it becomes a new center, a focus, a focus point for cooperation. And it becomes, in this sense, a bridge between, one, between two countries or between three countries, depending on where the circumstances, where they are, the geo, geopolitical position of these countries. 
Uh, this is an example uh, uh, put into practice what we know uh, the cooperation in the European Union and the, uh, the EGTCs, so the, the Council of Europe, EC, ECGs, what we know, the Euro regions as such as they exist. Uh, the third uh, situation scenario is where we have uh, uh, mobile uh, movements, but they come from the periphery to the, to the center, and uh, the border is closed, the, that the other side of the border is closed for cooperation. It is said here that it's no man's land, but in fact that it, those population that live from the periphery until the, the center, though that they are mobile within the city, the sovereignty of a state, they don't have uh, uh, interaction, cooperation, collaboration, uh, any relationship with the other side of the border. This is why the, the, the term is used as a no man's land. And the, the, the last scenario, last option is where we have, of course, again, from periphery, relations from periphery to the, the, to the center of the state, where, uh, of course, again, uh, we have a closed border, uh, but, but we, we still have uh, possibilities for some interactions with the other side, which is uh, marginalized in this sense, seen as margin from the centralized government of the state. This, this will be explained maybe further on when we move to the position with the first case. So there, there is the first case where, where there is no pure classification of minorities nor majorities. It is a situation where there is a full assimilation and integration in the society of ethnic groups where globalization is actually the key element, where we have everybody is equal, uh, there is no discrimination upon race, upon ethnicity, upon religion. We live in a globalized world, so we can say that all the world and the globalization that is happening to us maybe is a feature of this first, uh, uh, first scenario. Of course, the state and its population are open to the world to collaborate for every possible social aspect. What I see here, it's not only the large uh, landscapes of countries like states like uh, Australia and United States, but I also see this as uh, uh, the position of international uh, organizations, governmental organizations, such as uh, United Nations, where you have the population that the states that are open to collaborate on different, different aspects, of course, considering their sovereignty and authority over their certain, certain territory. And uh, uh, liberalism, individual rights here are dominant because each individual is citizen is, uh, is seen as important as individual person, personality, uh, and there is no distinction between, you know, person uh, belonging to a so certain social group or ethnic group because globalization takes everybody uh, into their own, uh, you know, own basket, let's say, uh, under the same roof. The, the second situation, second scenario, is actually the ones that uh, is common to uh, the European continent as we, we know it today, and I guess it was explained in the previous panel in the morning by some of the speakers that they talked about European cooperation, that the uh, uh, European groupings of territorial cooperation and the Euro region. So here we have a situation where uh, uh, where we, uh, we have cross-border cooperation is in its essence. And then on the bo both sides of the border, there is an interest for cooperation that the minorities have possibilities, many possibilities given by the states that cooperate uh, between them through the instruments of cross-border cooperation. This is why within, through my presentation, I see the cross-border cooperation as one very important tool as a breach of minorities and majorities from both sides of the border, where I see minorities as, as a key element and key aspect of triggering cross-border cooperation, because in the border areas, as we know it today in Europe, that, can, that are uh, pretty much uh, identified as multi-ethnic and multinational, uh, where we have a population uh, belonging to uh, uh, one or two or many uh, many uh, many uh, ethnic and uh, national groups. Uh, we have the minorities as, a, as an essential element and as something that we can use in order to trigger cross-border cooperation even, even further. So we have the new center, a bridge 
that we can cross on the other side of the country and we can, we can use it as a, as a tool. Minorities, of course, uh, their position pretty much depends on the state and how they are regulated. So if the state in these circumstances have uh, uh, a decentralized uh, government, government where, where is locally or regionally centered and it's self-governed uh, with most of the aspects such as economy, uh, cultural issues, education, environment, uh, uh, trade, economy, where the, we, can, we can really have a space for minorities to be, to be influenced, but I will come back to that uh, in a minute. The third one is the case of closed mobile border, where if minorities are recognized by the state, they are seen only on a state level and there is no possibility for them to interact locally or to represent their interest on a local level. This is why there, this is so-called a cent centralistic approach to territorial governance. And we have maybe forms of decentralization, but in terms of deconcentration, meaning that the central government deconcentrates some of their activities on a local or a regional level, but it is just the aim to easy up on the process of governing the whole territory. For, a, for example, if we have an educational facilities funded, established by the state as a, as a, uh, or by a ministry of education or by the government, then with the, with the form of deconcentration, we, uh, the government can open uh, a affiliation or an, an institution on the border or on the periphery of this territory in order to easy up or to uh, engage the local population in the educational facilities. The same thing comes with, uh, for example, high schools, primary schools, which are dispersed on the whole territory, but these are states, uh, state funded or state established, and they all depend on the decision-making process of state authorities, not lo on local authorities. This is what I mean about deconcentration. And, um, of course, there is no possibility here for cross-border cooperation because it is centralized state. Uh, there's no possibility for minorities to be involved on a local or a regional level, only on a state level. So the state level, uh, depending on, uh, on the, their recognition under, under the law, constitution and, and decrees and laws on the national, national laws, they will have, if they have a decision-making power, if they participate in the government or in the parliament as members of the minorities, they can maybe influence on the cross, on, on cooperation on the side of the border, but this is not the only key. The key is also to have a decentralized, uh, decentralized government. And the last is the closed static border, a border, a case where we have decentralization in a form of the de deconcentration, such as a previous case, but also on a delegation. So you have a local self-government units which they don't have the full authority, full autonomy over the population and the territory, but they serve the state interest. They can, uh, they can sign uh, intermunicipal agreements with the other municipality of the other side of the border, and they can have memorandums of understanding, for example, uh, or, and, and in this sense, cross-border cooperation exists only in a form of bilateral or multilateral agreements, state versus state. So only the state can interact in these governmental uh, agreements and the municipality can act on behalf of the state and can sign these uh, municipal agreements or the same level agreements, not on a state level, but on a municipal level. So min minorities, again, if they're recognized by the state, are seen also on a state level and they can be acknowledged as well on the regional and local level, but uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, pretty much depends on the statistical information, on the threshold, on the percentage of their influence over the territory or the presence of the territory. Uh, they can be also involved in the state agreements that two states sign while they are uh, identifying their cooperation and formally recognized, uh, recognized on the basis, of course, of the reciprocity. If Hungary recognizes Hungar uh, Romanian minority, then uh, Romania recognizes Hungarian minority. This is just an example of a, of a reciprocity that could occur uh, in theory and generally, uh, generally speaking. So, uh, of course, uh, cross-border cooperation, you know already what it is and what kind of instrument it is. 
it is not for me to give a speech and teach about this uh, among many scholars and experts you have in the online as well as uh, in the premises of the conference uh, is but it is a instrument which is a multi-faced practice multi uh, multinational instrument where an instrument that it can be used to link two entities together and in, in unfortunately speaking uh, among the practices that has been going on on a cross-border level, we, we've seen examples, but we don't see them in enough linked with minorities as, as a help tool, as an, as an instrument. So th this is why uh, there are some certain areas that, of course, determine cross-border cooperation and uh, influence the successfulness of cross-border cooperation that needs to be taken into account while we answer the question whether minorities can influence cross-border cooperation or not. Of course, if you're a member of the EU, it's easier. But if you're not a member of the EU, such as North Macedonia, where I come from, it is not easy enough to enhance cross-border cooperation because North Macedonia does not go into the regional policy of the EU. North Macedonia has cross-border cooperation as a concept, but only through the instrument of pre-accession, uh, which is the IPA. And uh, uh, there is, in the heads of um, Macedonians and the citizens living on the territory of, uh, of North Macedonia and other Western Balkan countries, which are not part of the, of the EU, there is no notion of cross-border cooperation as a true instrument for bridging. It is only, so this is an example, it is only a, on a state level that maybe it is emphasized through the instruments of pre-accession help, uh, financing help that they can, uh, they can receive from the European Union. May so I shortly you interrupt you, Marina, you have three more minutes. Yeah, thank you, I'm finishing, yeah. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so the relationship between neighboring states is also very important. If you have block of intersystems, such as explain, I, I explained before, of course you won't have cross-border cooperation. And the, the degree of state centralization depends, uh, depends uh, and influences cross-border cooperation issues. So how minorities and cross-border cooperation are, uh, are linked together of course, if you involve minorities in cross-border cooperation, you have mutual trust. You have a common vision for cross-border area, that area where you have different minorities which are majority on the other side of the border. So here you have the link, here you have the mutual trust, you have shared goals to improve the life of qualities. You have uh, easy up on the process of identifying any obstacles that you have or any resources that you can use. It is it's more easier to use the minorities from the other side of the border because they speak the same language or a dialect of the language. They have the similar cultural, uh, cultural uh, customs and morals and, uh, and uh, it identities where you can use for the negotiation. So this is more of a political, uh, political influence that you can have in order to mediate between two different worlds, if I, if I can express myself in that way. So solidarity, accountability, transparency, it's more easy. Uh, partnership is working more easily. You have best practices that you can use and you, that you can explain and, and, and transfer on, the, on other examples. What is, um, what is uh, the negative sides is that you have maybe a slow decision-making process because in some certain points, maybe minorities don't have decision making. Maybe they have to go through to the centralized or decentralized government in order to perform their contacts on the other side of the border. You have democratic deficit if you don't allow minorities through minority associations, organizations to influence cross-border cooperation. And of course, all the bureaucracy behind cross-border cooperation, even without minorities, is already difficult in some cases. So it is part of a you know, negative side effect of, of a minority cycle, uh, so cross-border uh, cycle. So basic elements and questions to be answered uh, of uh, uh, whether minorities communities are involved are nine. Is CBC the instrument that is recognized by law? If yes, do minorities have a voice? Are they involved in decision making? Which are the domains of cooperation? Are there uh, are the domains that are in, uh, involved uh, and uh, have language, cultural policies, education for minorities, or they are not? If they are not, then minorities don't have any 
interest to be involved. Whether there is a feasibility study performed, whether it is the CBC that the population on the border area want or they don't want, or whether there is a certain area that they can enhance, like health services, which are most, uh, most uh, uh, sensitive. Uh, if I want to travel to the capital, I have to take uh, a lot of kilometers and costs, so I, I can go across the border, which is easy for me, and help, have the health services there. And it is more, uh, and time is very important when it comes to health. And uh, uh, procedure for formally creating CBC, are minorities involved there? Any quota system that they can have? Nature of legal entity, whether it is recognized by private law, meaning the minorities, if they form a legal entity, whether it is recognized and it can influence in the border, cross-border uh, corporation organs, bodies of that legal entity. What is the budget, whether the budget uh, takes into account the transparent level, uh, transparency, and include minorities in all processes. What is the set of uh, employees? Should they be represented accordingly? Is there is a qu quota system, numerical presence, and the rules of a control, whether the monitoring of the work done by the CBC controlled by the state, or uh, in which the minorities also have a voice, or they, ha they are represented in the parliament, let's say, in the government with their own representation. I tried in three minutes, Martin, to, to give this final remarks, and, but I'm open, of course, for any questions after, after my presentation. Well, thank you me. almost kept the three minutes. Wonderful. Now, thank you, Marina. I, I really like the way you structured these different scenarios on how minorities relate to borders, and I think this is pioneer work. I don't think anybody has done that so far, even though we have quite a lot of in research on minorities. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, questions from the audience? Yes, Joanna, you haven't had it. Hi, hi, Marina. Nice hi, to Anna. see you. Uh, I have one question because you presented us some factors related to minorities' involvement in cross border cooperation. My experience is that there's another factor very important, especially when you uh, conduct the research on a local level. I uh, realized that this is very important, this is necessary to. Uh, research also the relations, the local relations between the minority and the uh, community generally in this area. Yes, because I have some examples there, uh, these relations are very well, and then the minority is possible to be included in the cross border cooperation, but there are some cases. I don't want to, to tell you the name of countries maybe now, but they are examples that uh, not so good relations between the local um, community and minority yes, on this area. Uh, this is a factor can, uh, with that can be a barrier in cross-border cooperation development in this area. What do you think about this? Uh, yeah, of course, there are cases, there is a spectrum of bad and good uh, examples. Uh, if we talk about, for example, uh, borders like Italy, Austria, Italy, France, Italy, Italy, Slovenia, where uh, we have for, for the same country, which is Italy as a focal point, and I'm ex explaining an example, we have different scenarios, different scenarios put into practice. We have more cooperation with Austria, less cooperation with Slovenia, and even lesser in Croatia because the communication, the, the the politics behind the relationship, as you say, the relations between minorities and majorities in the country is different. Of course, in larger countries such as Italy, it's more easier to spot the, the differences. In smaller countries uh, such as Slovenia, it's, it's, uh, it's less evident. Uh, uh, of course, it's easier to, to see the ter territory because it's smaller. Because it's, but it's less evident to see the, the positive and the negative sides very clearly. For example, uh, the Slovenian minority in Italy has less voice when it comes to the uh, decision-making process in the regions that border Italy with Slovenia, such as Cruli, Venezia, Giulia, for example. Uh, there are more representatives coming from the Italian majority than the Slovene mi mi minority. Having this into, into mind, you can see that from the side of the Italian border, let's say, you have less interest to cooperate uh, by the Italians, but more interest to the Slovenians, but the Slovenians do, don't have enough instrument or political influence to be part of this cross-border initiative. This is why uh, I say that, uh, 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 you know, there is a, 
how is the domain of cooperation and whether it did, what kind of nature of legal entity is recognized. So if in the case of Italy, you have a recognition of the Slovenes as associations where they can work for cross-border cooperation, then it's a different thing. But if you say that Trulli Venezia Giulia is the one that is responsible for uh, signing agreements with the municipalities or regions on the, in Slovenia, then that is different. So you go on, a, on an upper level. Of course, EGTC there existing, there is an EGTC, GO, it is called GO, which uh, uh, links uh, Gorizia, the region of Gorizia, Nova Gorica. It is very influential and it helps a lot. But it helps a lot only on a territorial uh, development. It doesn't help to uh, increase the minority status on, on the border. Uh, you understand what I'm saying and as an example. So I, I, I agree completely with you. And uh, uh, if I go on the northern part of Italy, where there are uh, German-speaking population, Austrians living, German-speaking population, Italian citizens, but uh, they speak German, they, they come from the, 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 uh, uh, the Austrian uh, heritage, culture, cultural heritage, they say Bolzano, uh, Alto Adige, South Tyrol, you see differently. You see uh, uh, Trentino, Alto Adige, or Trentino, South Tyrol, uh, EGTC, uh, as a very important tool, both for promoting minority protection and promoting territorial development and, and, and governance. So it all depends, in essence, whether within the state territory, uh, the position, how the position of minorities are, whether they have a separate decision-making body and institution that they can use for influencing within cross-border cooperation and uh, promoting their interests, such as, you know, cultural heritage, like language, education, etc. Thank you. Uh, we have... Answered, uh, or, you know, tried thank... to answer, Joanna. Uh, uh, thank how... you. Uh, we have a question from Gula Okshai from CSCI in Budapest. Um, very well structured and clear theoretical model. I like it very much. What about practice? In our Eastern European region, minorities are often seen as Trojan horses instead of bridges. What kind of experience do you have in this field? Yes, unfortunately, as I, yeah, it is linked pretty much with Joanna and what I have explained before as a question. And uh, uh, of course, this is, this is a theoretical model that, uh, that should be developed further and should be used as a tool. Unfortunately, uh, trying to answer these nine questions, you will end up with examples which they don't have even the, the first two or three uh, uh, answered as yes. Or if I say a checkbox, yes, you, you, you are this element that I can go further, you know, with the line of uh, triggering cross-border cooperation. Unfortunately, in Eastern countries, in Western Balkan countries, we have situations where minorities are not uh, uh, used as a, as a tool. It is very bad to say people used as a tool. <laughs> I'm sorry if uh, you know sociologists maybe in the room can criticize me, but it is a it is a, a political instrument instruments that states can and should use in order to boost the cooperation and the mutual respect. Unfortunately, minorities are not uh, involved, if it is more politically correct to say involved in the cooperation because of many internal issues that they have within the, within the state. So what I have emphasized in the four scenarios is how the state uh, recognized and what is the level of recognition or level of liberty, autonomy, and freedom of minorities to act. If you have already have a situation on a center, center, centralized level, on a state level, where minorities are still marginalized on a state level, it is difficult, of course, on a, on a local, on a regional level to expect that minorities will be further involved. This is the only case where you can have a regional autonomy, a local autonomy, and then in that case, you can give a further autonomy to minorities. Of Adige, uh, the case of uh, uh, of uh, other experience such as in uh, in uh, Spain, sometimes negative, sometimes positive, but still, regional autonomy gives certain uh, certain autonomy, certain uh, liberties and space for minorities to uh, to act. 
I haven't tested, I haven't uh, initiated a research with this methodology, with this analytical tool yet. So I am welcome uh, for uh, other scientists, political scientists, sociologists, the lawyers that are interested to, to be able to start this testing and whether we have a larger percentage that, that is, is still not ready to meet these basic elements or we have positive best practices that we can use and we can, of course, best practices are only as a help, as an example. But we can, uh, models are there to help us understand, but models cannot be transferred into an, uh, a different reality. So each country's case study, of course, should be examined separately and should be seen through these, uh, let's say, analytical uh, instruments or questions that I, that I have posed today. If I may follow up on this, uh, Marina, I yes. think, I think yes. because I think your lens four with this open, well, I don't know if it's in four, but with the open, open static border. Uh, and then if we connect it to this, uh, I mean, we are, uh, Marina and Hinek and Joanna and I are members of a cost network, which is working on non-territorial autonomy, um, which is a concept where you try to accommodate uh, minority interests uh, without challenging borders, basically, without challenging the status of a state, uh, and then uh, in this way avoiding this fifth column uh, paradigm, which is, can be very accurate in, in, in some, or has been, actually has been accurate even in border regions, which can, today are considered best practice examples as the Danish German one. Um, so, um, uh, in, in, from my observations uh, in, in the field, I would argue that, that this model of the, of the open but static border, I mean, unchallenged, uh, and uh, and then of course minority models of NTA uh, like a uh, free like diversity management in this open border region uh, would be the way forward. Would you agree? Yes, definitely, definitely. I'm your, on your side, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question? Yes. Marina, thank you very much for your input. I found this uh, intersection between borderlands and minority issues very interesting. And I would like to follow this uh, context and place it in the uh, Central Eastern European um, um, uh, context uh, and it's the external border of European Union. I would like to ask you about the role of national state, uh, from which perspective minorities are perceived often as, as a, some kind of a, a internal problem for the national integration, but also from the perspective on the states with a diaspora uh, in different countries, uh, these states are, have a feeling of responsibility of the diaspora living abroad. And uh, some states like Poland or Hungary a few years ago introduced some special provisions for minorities living abroad. It um, uh, applies especially for Poles living in Ukraine, in Belarus, or Hungarians living in Ukraine or um, uh, Serbia, for example. And uh, this gives them, uh, the representatives of minorities, uh, um, an easier access to healthcare, to educational services. Uh, uh, they, they are allowed to cross border more uh, easily. Uh, they, they have a right for a stay in a mother country, let's say. And uh, how, in your opinion, such provisions, let's say, external support for the minorities, supports cross-border cooperation and integration because it stimulates the people flows, um, uh, linkages between non-governmental organizations, or it creates a vision of uh, maybe not fifth column, but some foreign agents, as it is presented nowadays in Belarus, for example, uh, and it, uh, in fact, hampers cross-border cooperation integration in the uh, uh, scale um, between the countries. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A uh, very interesting question because it links diaspora. And diaspora is a very, uh, uh, very uh, useful, uh, uh, useful uh, instrument that states uh, often use in order to influence in diplomatic relations, right? Uh, foreign policies, diplomatic relations. They use the diaspora to boost the, the negotiations or to boost the, uh, the mutual, uh, uh, mutual cooperation between two countries, whether they are on the border uh, 
uh, linked or they are across, uh, you know, they're very far. Uh, of course, there are examples that not only Poland and Hungary have, but also other countries have, other small countries which are not uh, politically uh, uh, in a high power on an international arena, international relations, but they use this, this diaspora or foreign uh, investments which return to the country as a, as a tool for boost the economy as well. Foreign agents is a very interesting term that you used, and uh, I really liked it in terms of they're not, uh, they don't practice peonage, but uh, they are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, useful to, uh, to link uh, to, uh, to uh, worlds together, to identities together. Um, these provisions uh, as economic, uh, economical incentives uh, uh, are uh, a support of, uh, of minorities uh, in certain aspects. If they tackle interests of minorities in the country, yes. But if they, if they generally work for the uh, position of the, min uh, of the di diaspora in a certain countries, then they forget about the minorities in the state, on the state level. Because diasporas usually, uh, they work uh, uh, for promoting the country where they come from, right? The origin, the kin state. Uh, but uh, they promote also their position in the state where they actually now pre are present and reside. So they, they more work of the economic, uh, economic cooperation, economic boost. They don't have that much influence on the minorities' uh, uh, status and situation because their interest is quite different from the interest of minorities living already on a state. I don't know if you have, uh, you have experienced this, this is just a practical experience, but when, for example, I can share my personal perception and experience of the Macedonian diaspora abroad, which is everywhere, almost everywhere, but most prominent in US and Australia, they uh, return the money, you know, they, they have a certain economic activity in these countries and they try to return the money into their kin state in order to boost the economy because this is a small country, so they like to invest. And that is more than welcome. But that doesn't help the position of, uh, of uh, their, uh, their uh, situation in, a, in, a, in other countries. They just want to influence and they... Uh, they often mingle in the internal affairs of the country where they come from, even though they don't pay taxes in their country, because every citizen, citizenship is linked to the responsibilities of one citizen that it has in a country. So if you pay taxes, you already are part of influencing the policies internally. But if you are the diaspora of a second or third generation, which only gives economical boost of the, of the country, but it does not Boost, I mean transfer of money. You know, you go to a bank and you transfer money to a, to a, a domestic, uh, let's say, firm or family in the country on the, across the border, and this is the only thing that you do. Of course, that you help, but uh, you, you, this doesn't give you the right to mingle into internal affairs or to, to say uh, and to, to state what will be the... Marina, yes? sorry, I have to cut you off now. Oh, sorry. But so you're, uh, because we have a I very hope, tight yeah, schedule, I but I, 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 I mean, it was a very interesting discussion. And actually, you have been leading over to the next speaker in a way by f coming into the di di diaspora issue. Um, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, our last keynote speaker in this session, last not least, is Ms. Uh, Professor Dangis Guedelis from Mikonash Romeris University in Vilnius in Lithuania, who has a very strong background on diaspora studies. Um, but today he will talk with, to us about municipal cross-border cooperation and possibilities and opportunities there. The floor is yours. We can see you. Hello. Hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, we can also afternoon. hear you. We can also hear you. It's already afternoon in Vilnius. Uh, so, um, well, it's already afternoon here, too. Yeah. So my presentation, uh, uh, the title of my presentation is Lessons and Opportunities uh, of uh, uh, our Collaboration Between Polish and Lithuanian uh, Municipalities. So I'm going uh, uh, to uh, examine uh, the uh, practices of uh, cooperation uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, the 
data which is uh, presented uh, uh, in the portal of European uh, Regional Development uh, Fund, Interreg uh, uh, program, and uh, also uh, on the database of Lithuanian Municipality Association uh, about uh, uh, international agreements uh, between Lithuanian municipalities and uh, uh, cities uh, of uh, different countries of the world. So I am uh, going to focus on the uh, partnership agreements uh, uh, between Lithuanian municipalities and uh, and uh, uh, Polish uh, municipalities. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, those two countries, uh, Lithuania and Poland, uh, have uh, uh, a long uh, a common history and uh, a tradition of uh, cooperation uh, since the times of uh, uh, the Republic of uh, Two Nations uh, since uh, 16th century. Uh, and uh, uh, there were uh, different uh, uh, periods of uh, the relationships, uh, but uh, now I'm going to focus uh, on the last uh, 30 years. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, uh, there are two uh, um, mainly uh, two main ways uh, how uh, uh, municipalities of uh, uh, two countries uh, collaborate. Uh, uh, and uh, one, one of the uh, uh, way of cooperation uh, is uh, uh, collaboration in uh, joint cross-border uh, cooperation projects uh, which are funded by European Regional Development uh, Fund. Uh, in fact, there were uh, three, state, three periods of uh, this cooperation uh, since uh, Europe, uh, Lithuania joined uh, uh, the European Union. There was a program uh, Neighborhood, neighborhood uh, program uh, uh, which funded uh, joint pro uh, projects uh, between Lithuania, Poland, and uh, Kaliningrad uh, region of Russian Federation. Uh, then there was a next uh, period uh, uh, of uh, funding uh, which started in 2007 and uh, uh, in those uh, seven uh, years, uh, there were uh, mainly two uh, programs uh, which uh, funded uh, cross-border cooperation projects. Uh, the first one was uh, focused on uh, uh, joint pro uh, projects between Lithuania and Poland, uh, it's operational program, uh, Lithuania, Poland, uh, and the uh, uh, second uh, source of funding uh, uh, was focused on projects uh, including uh, uh, three countries, Lithuania, Poland, and uh, Russia. And uh, 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 this uh, uh, program was uh, mainly focused on large infrastructure projects, uh, which included uh, 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 envi environmental protection, uh, uh, development of sewage uh, systems, uh, roads, uh, building, and uh, various transport infrastructure uh, projects. And then, uh, uh, beginning from the year 2014, the uh, next uh, uh, period of Interreg uh, Poland Lithuania uh, program, uh, which uh, uh, covered uh, those regions which you can see in this uh, picture, uh, uh, three sub-regions uh, sub uh, from Poland, uh, Belstok, uh, Elk, uh, Suwalki uh, was included in this uh, uh, cross-border uh, program. 
and uh, five co counters from Lithuania, uh, Tauragie, uh, Mariampole, Alitus, uh, uh, Kaunas, and uh, Vilnius. Actually, uh, they covered uh, almost more, more than half of the uh, territory of uh, Lithuania. So, uh, various uh, uh, institutions, uh, including municipalities, uh, uh, had a possibility to uh, participate in this pro uh, program uh, by applying uh, uh, with uh, different projects. Uh, uh, projects uh, had to uh, uh, have also partners uh, from uh, those three regions uh, of Poland. And the total amount uh, of the budget uh, uh, for those uh, seven years was uh, 60 million uh, euros. Uh, uh, there were uh, five objectives uh, for, uh, for in this program and uh, uh, in, for, for each of these objectives, uh, there was a possibility to apply uh, for funding. Uh, and uh, uh, in total, uh, 85 projects uh, were uh, uh, funded. Uh, some of them uh, still are ongoing. Uh, some of them already uh, ended. And uh, uh, for the first... Uh, Objective uh, uh, 21 projects uh, got funding. Uh, got funding. Uh, the first objective uh, was focused uh, on the uh, natural and cultural heritage and the development of uh, tourism uh, uh, in the cross-border area. Uh, the uh, next objective uh, was to promote business creation, development, and cooperation for improved business support services. Uh, uh, only uh, four projects uh, got fund funding, uh, uh, which uh, uh, were uh, targeted to uh, this objective. And then uh, uh, the next uh, uh, objective was to decrease unemployment for coordinated uh, cross-border employment uh, initiatives the target uh, groups, uh, uh, the target group uh, for this objective uh, uh, was uh, uh, young people uh, which uh, had difficulties of unemployment, uh, and uh, two projects uh, uh, got uh, uh, funding uh, which uh, helped to uh, implement uh, to contribute to this objective. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, a larger number, a bit larger number of uh, projects was funded uh, in, uh, to uh, contribute to the objective uh, uh, to enhance access to social and healthcare services. Uh, uh, and uh, target groups uh, uh, for uh, uh, the projects uh, which contributed to this uh, objective uh, were uh, vulnerable groups, uh, elderly people, uh, and uh, people with uh, disabilities, uh, and uh, also uh, people which needed healthcare uh, services. And the fourth uh, and the fi uh, fifth uh, objective, uh, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, uh, covered by uh, 33 uh, projects uh, and uh, this objective uh, uh, was focused uh, on uh, improvement of public governance and public services uh, and uh, uh, the ta target group uh, was uh, public uh, governance institutions and organizations. Uh, so. Uh, the analysis of uh, uh, projects uh, which were funded uh, uh, in this period uh, uh, helped uh, to identify uh, those uh, main, mainly main activities uh, uh, which uh, uh, got funded. Uh, uh, 
So um, many of the projects, uh, or some of the projects, were focused uh, uh, were, uh, were uh, inclu included uh, uh, such activities as uh, uh, discussions, debates, seminars, uh, workshops, uh, study visits, uh, mentoring, uh, excursions, uh, uh, various public events uh, such as uh, heritage-driven events or conferences or sport events, uh, uh, camps, uh, do so-called uh, so uh, soft uh, activities, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, projects included uh, uh, such activities as uh, installation and the repairment of uh, in tourist infrastructure, restoration of cultural, natural uh, heritage uh, sites, uh, uh, purchase of equipment, uh, and uh, so so on. So um, also there was an interesting project uh, which uh, uh, Included such activities as uh, joint uh, reading, uh, cooking, uh, and create, creating uh, movies, but uh, that was a single example. Uh, so, uh, those are major activities which uh, uh, repeated uh, themselves in different projects uh, for the different uh, objectives. Uh, and uh, uh, I also mentioned that, uh, that uh, another way how municipalities uh, cooperate uh, uh, is uh, so-called a tradition of uh, sister cities uh, cooperation. Uh, in the database of uh, Lithuanian uh, Association of Municipalities, uh, 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 there is a data about uh, 2002 partnerships uh, between um, different Lithuanian municipalities and uh, different uh, uh, Polish uh, uh, cities. Uh, and uh, uh, 40, 45 partnerships uh, from those 2002 partnerships uh, were established uh, until uh, 2002. Uh, and the higher number of partnerships were signed in the next decade uh, from 2000 to 2010. Uh, 123 partnerships uh, were started in this period. And in the uh, uh, current uh, decade, uh, 28 uh, partnerships were started uh, between Lithuanian municipalities and uh, Polish uh, municipalities. Uh, the analysis of uh, those uh, uh, agreements uh, also uh, showed uh, that uh, uh, yeah, it could be con concluded uh, or maybe presumed that uh, uh, the major drivers of those partnerships uh, uh, were uh, the number of residents of Polish nationality living in uh, municipalities. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, the two municipalities, uh, which uh, uh, have the highest number of uh, Polish uh, residents, uh, Szelczyninka and Vilnius district municipalities, uh, they had uh, uh, the largest number of uh, partnerships uh, with uh, different uh, Polish uh, cities uh, or rural uh, municipalities, uh, 24 partnerships for Szelczyninka and uh, 41 partnership uh, for Vilnius district municipality. Uh, and uh, the next driver is uh, proximity of municipalities to the Polish Lithuanian border. For example, Lesdia district municipality, which uh, uh, is uh, on the border with uh, Poland, uh, uh, had uh, uh, eight uh, Partnership agreements, uh, Calvaria municipality, which is also on the board, is, uh, had uh, seven uh, um, partnership agreements. 
Alitus district municipality, which is a bit uh, further, uh, had uh, nine partnership uh, agreements, and uh, Varena had seven partnership ad uh, agreements. So we, uh, here you can see uh, the municipalities, uh, LSDA, you can see that LSDA and Calvaria, in fact, uh, the uh, borders uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, Suvalki region. And Alitus and Varena are not also so far. And Druskininke had uh, four uh, partnership agreements. Uh, Mariampole, Alitus City also had uh, four partnership uh, agreements. Kazluruda, you can see, uh, is also not so far from the border. Also, he uh, has uh, four uh, partnership agreements uh, for Polish uh, cities. Uh, uh, probably there is uh, a relationship between uh, uh, the amount of uh, project uh, applications for European Regional Development uh, Fund and uh, 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 sister city uh, partnerships. Uh, uh, I haven't uh, check checked uh, uh, this uh, uh, presumed uh, relationship. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, we could uh, uh, hypothesize that uh, probably there is uh, such a, such a relationship. Sister uh, cities partnership, uh, uh, according to uh, Kevin O'Toole, uh, uh, who wrote an article in 2001 about uh, collaboration between Australian and uh, Japanese uh, uh, sisters, uh, sister cities. Uh, uh, so uh, this kind of partnership uh, has uh, three uh, stages. Uh, the, the first one is uh, associative uh, stage, with, which is uh, the most superficial stage uh, when there is uh, uh, Cooperation, communication, and the building of uh, uh, relationships, uh, which Sorry, are may I just may disturb you? Understanding and goodwill and. Uh, Thank you. May I shortly disturb you? May I shortly disturb you? You have three more minutes. Okay. Yes. So, um, finishing. And uh, uh, reciprocity for relations and uh, deeper stage and uh, then commercial uh, relationships uh, are even more deeper stage. So, uh, if uh, we are now, uh, yeah, to conclude, uh, we could think about the potential and the, the, the future of uh, cooperation and uh, collaboration at the local level between Poland and uh, Lithuania. Uh, so, uh, one, one of the uh, future uh, directions uh, could be uh, the movement uh, from the movement to the deeper uh, stage of cooperation and uh, it's important also to learn from best practice and mis mistakes of the past uh, cooperation uh, but of course it's also important uh, uh, that this uh, cooperation uh, is focus uh, on the real needs uh, uh, and uh, uh, the public goods uh, which uh, cannot be uh, uh, provided in any other uh, way, uh, they also could be funded uh, uh, by different uh, cross-border cooperation projects uh, and uh, the future uh, regional development uh, uh, fund uh, program uh, should identify uh, such uh, public uh, goods and uh, provide uh, opportunities uh, to uh, to apply for municipalities as well as for other institutions. And uh, also, it's important to to broaden the scope and depth of uh, uh, cooperation by involving uh, new actors, uh, not only municipal organizations uh, but uh, also. Uh, 
civil society and also business uh, components uh, and uh, also the next trend could be uh, uh, the look, looking for um, different new communication uh, and cooperation channels uh, uh, by using uh, IT technologies uh, to communicate and uh, uh, to uh, uh, look for 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 new uh, ways uh, how to achieve uh, the common uh, goals. So uh, uh, this is uh, this is my uh, presentation. Uh, so please, uh, you can give uh, you can ask questions. Uh, Thank you, Dangis. Uh, yes. Issues. Thank you, Dennis, for another presentation of uh, thinking global and, and acting local, like city partnerships, this very bottom, top, bottom up, bottom related, uh, close to the citizen opportunities to engage in cross border cooperation. Uh, questions from the audience? Yes, Jana, please. Hi, hi, Dangis. Good afternoon. Uh, I can make some comments to these presentations because uh, some months ago we worked together with Dangis on this case, Polish, Lithuanian borderland. We analyzed some cross-border project, we analyzed some initiatives because now we are developing pilot cross-border functional area there. So uh, I work with Dangis on this project and I work also at the same time with my colleagues from University of Kaliningrad, from Russia, and we uh, did the same work with uh, other case, uh, Polish-Russian uh, cooperation, yes, um, thanks to Interreg support. And uh, I realized that the very strong motivation to enhance this cross-border cooperation, they are infrastructure needs, let's say. So both sides have the same needs strongly related to the infrastructure development thanks to the Interreg funds and they try to uh, be closer to each other to make some partnerships, to make some agreements and then to go together to Interreg with application to, uh, to realize their goals. Yes? This is very difficult for uh, long-term cross-border cooperation to uh, be active in this way because project by project you have to show the evaluate, uh, evaluators more and more in this cooperation. So my question, Dan, is, is uh, can you agree with me that the uh, motivation related to the infrastructure development in this case is, is very strong as a, um, a reason to uh, enhance the cross-border cooperation to develop this on, the, on this stage, on this moment? Or uh, do you think that there are other factors? Uh, yes, I agree that uh, our infrastructure um, uh, such as uh, tourism infrastructure uh, is uh, one one of the areas uh, where uh, this uh, uh, cross-border collaboration could uh, 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 could achieve uh, uh, some public value. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, is a so-called pure public uh, good and. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, it uh, provides effects, uh, positive effects, both for uh, for, for uh, both countries uh, or for free countries, uh, which uh, which are on the border, so uh, then uh, it has to be funded somehow uh, because. Uh, uh, this public good cannot be achieved by uh, any other uh, means. Uh, uh, so I mean that it, it has to be funded by uh, international, certain international program. Hynek uh, Pym. Hello, Dangis. Uh, let me have a question. You mentioned during your presentation that there were 25 projects supporting supporting the uh, cross border uh, provision of health and social care in cross border areas uh, i 
know very little about this uh, Polish-Lithuanian concept, so I, I don't know anything, to be frank. But let me ask you, does it mean that is there some kind of the cross-border provision of public services in terms of health care of the social services so that the Lithuanian patients go for treatment in the Polish hospitals or the other way around? Or are these just more or less the projects when, okay, that given the fact that the municipality is located in the borderland and it can by chance profit from an interreg, so it submits a project and there is no real cross-border provision in these uh, services? Thanks a lot. Yes, by analyzing uh, the abstracts of uh, those different uh, projects, I also got the impression that uh, some of those uh, projects uh, are implemented uh, just uh, as uh, an opportunity to, uh, to get funding uh, from uh, uh, European funds. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I should say that uh, from my uh, view, uh, there, there is no uh, such uh, a need uh, for, for such a project uh, which cannot be funded uh, by any other means. So, so it's, uh, it's quite uh, possible that the same activities could be funded uh, from the municipal budget or from the national budget. And uh, there is uh, actually there is, there is no need uh, uh, for uh, for. Uh, for, for the international uh, funding. But uh, as the, there was an opportunity for municipalities to, to get additional funding, uh, uh, so um, they applied for, for, for those projects. And I think we had uh, another question in the room, yes. Hello. I would like to talk about money. Um, can you explain to me, do you think that this collaboration, interregional collaboration, is so profitable for the cities, for the people, that they would like to pay for this? Because I'm afraid that, okay, we can collaborate only in the situation that we've got money for the project from the European funds, and suddenly we can find situation that the funds finished. And the question is, can we still, co still collaborate? Can we evaluate this collaboration as a profitable for us? And it is a general question, not only related to the interregional uh, collaboration, but also to the academic collaboration between universities from different countries. The question is, would you like to pay for this? If no funds, external funds? Thank you. Um, municipalities are rational actors and they uh, uh, calculate uh, the uh, costs and benefits of uh, uh, any activity and uh, uh, of international co cooperation as well. So I uh, assume that uh, uh, they uh, would opt uh, for uh, those uh, cooperation activities which uh, uh, could be beneficial uh, for them. Uh, so uh, if uh, th there are uh, certain projects which uh, uh, could, could, pro could be beneficial uh, for municipalities uh, even uh, without uh, 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 getting funding, uh, but uh, simply because uh, the uh, benefit uh, could, could be higher than co cost, so they will cho choose to cooperate. But uh, yeah, so uh, I uh, didn't, uh, I haven't uh, uh, did a, an empirical research. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's only my hypothesis. Yes, uh, I think this is a fine point to close because uh, I think now we have really focused on the key issue of this. So we have all these wonderful partnerships and projects and so on. But what do we really know about sustainable cooperation? about sustainable committing cooperation when you have to use your own resources. I think this is still the big issue 
uh, within this field of city partnerships, of Euro cities, of Euro districts, Euro regions, um, where the empiric material is rather weak, or well, we know very little. So uh, let's give all three presenters a hand. We had a very interesting session again. Um, thank you all for committing your time to our conference, even though you could not be present here. So we will now have our lunch break, and uh, for the online audience, we will be back here at, uh, at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m., 1400 hours Central European time. Raz, dwa, trzy. Weź słuchawki. Raz, dwa, tak.
Jest druga. Ten zimne. Musimy rozpocząć punktualnie. No dobra. Ok. So, yes. ladies and gentlemen, so it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you at the afternoon part of our conference. I'm sorry, I'll be bad with the microphone. But... So, I've got the pleasure to welcome here a distinguished guest of the panel who are both online and present with us. So, we are very happy that you are with us. It's not very often in these COVID times, but believe me or not, we have got even an audience. So if I can ask camera to show that there are live people in the audience, which is now quite unique during the pandemics, as we have got these online conferences only. So I would love to welcome also our distinguished audience. So we are happy that you are with us. We must warn you, that this block comes immediately after lunch. Do you know what this means? <laughs> the biology of a human basically asks for a sleep. I made it for five minutes at least, so I'm more or less fresh. But still, let me advance apologize if we do anything inappropriate or so, so this is given the time. Now, uh, let me introduce to you who do we have as a speaker here. So, if I, uh, if I start with the people who are uh, present here, so it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you, Professor Katarzyna Dobrosadnik. Okay. Pleasure to welcome here uh, Adam Pavlicek from the Prague University of Economics and Business. Uh, don't worry. As you know, the people from Borderlands quite often don't like people from the capitals. We all know that the Prague is the capital of Czechia. However, there is a good news, which is, I ask Adam, he is firstly representing the faculty, which has got its seat in southern Bohemia, in wonderful Jindřich Uhradec, if I'm not mistaken. Just, just small city. Yeah, just small city. He has got another affiliation in Olomouc, and moreover, the best news, he is from Czech part of Cheshin. And uh, the last person who is uh, physically with us is Professor Bohemil Horák from the Technical University of Ostrava. Um, and who we have uh, online. So it's my enormous pleasure to welcome uh, between us uh, uh, Jula Ochkai from Budapest and Estergom. Hello, Jula. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Jula is one of the people to host work we referred already in the first section. You might remember the presentation which was given by Eduardo Medeiros. Eduardo presented us his last paper on the COVID fencing. And actually one of the important actors was Jula in his capacity of the director of SESCI Budapest. And he's really one of the person who does a lot, lot good Excellent work for the cross-border cooperation in this, kind of this part of Europe. So, Jula, I'm really, really very happy that you are here with us, at least in this form. 
Then uh, we have got the pleasure to have here uh, two uh, ladies online, and I'm so uh, one lady online. I'm sorry, and so we have got here the pleasure to welcome and then uh, Ms. Oh, Gabriela Carmen from uh, University Alexandrion Kuzadinyasi. Oh, That's welcome. Hello. Hello. And we have got also here with us at the moment, is it Amir Omar from Olomouc? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, and ladies and gentlemen, you can see there is one person who was not introduced yet. So it's my enormous pleasure to welcome here my colleague from the Opole University and friend of mine, uh, Dr. Wojciech Opiowa who will uh, have an initial word to this very session. So, Wojtek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you, Hynek, for this introduction. Thank you for inviting me for this conference. Uh, for me, it's the first time for being a, a participant of hybrid uh, conference and also the first time when I am a participant of roundtable debate. And I have a great pleasure to address to you some introduction. Um, I would like to express as my introduction some criticism to, um, to, um, to the topic of cross-border projects as a drivers for the territorial cooperation. As I discussed with Joanna, so I think I have an agreement to, um, to criticize somehow, but my perspective will be maybe not a criticism as a whole to the, uh, to the idea of cross-border cooperation or the interreg initiative. I would like to focus more on the um, different, I think, conditions uh, of cross-border cooperation in the region of Central and Eastern Europe and uh, Eduardo Medeiros today morning and also James Scott mentioned some of these uh, features or conditions of uh, or different conditions of, uh, of uh, cross-border integration in different parts of, uh, of European Union. Um, I will use two theoretical approaches during my uh, speech. How much time I have? 15 or 5? minutes so um, I will use all or maybe I will have in my mind um, the, the idea of three dimensions of cross-border uh, cooperation or cross-border integration by Frederic Durand and Antoine de Covy it's an institutional dimension the um, functional dimension and the ideational dimension uh, and also the, the concept of, uh, of threshold of uh, indifference by uh, Martin van der Velde and Henk van Houtum as a phenomena, I think, very familiar for some of the border regions in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and my, my case, my example uh, I, I've studied is the western part of Czech-Polish border. So it's not the area where we are situated, but more on the on the western side so i can start with the um, with the uh, thought that one of the first steps of cross border cooperation uh, is searching for funds uh, as the main actors of cross-border cooperations are uh, local and regional authorities, NGOs, uh, sometimes schools, uniformed services, uh, these institutions have rather limited own sources for uh, these um, tasks for strengthening the CBC. And we can also say, we should say that this is not the priority of, uh, of local institutions on the border areas. So, of course, the basic, um, the, main, the main source of uh, CBC is the Interreg Initiative. Uh, 
Of course, this program is extremely important for all the European regions, and we can uh, recognize this as a, one of the biggest success story of European integration. It is really needed, but for uh, for some re border regions, uh, for low, low and moderate developed, inte low integrated border regions, um, I see some uh, weaknesses of uh, of interreg, or maybe of our interpretations of interreg. So. Let me introduce some historical conditions, some geographical conditions of, of the Central and Eastern European conditions of, of borderlands. I, I believe that my, my case, uh, Czech-Polish border, the western part of Czech-Polish border, is a good example of, of Central European borders as a whole. So we face some legacies. We face, we in Central Eastern Europe, the legacy of World War I and World War II, uh, what means the change of the state borders. It's uh, common for Poland, for Hungary, uh, for uh, Czechia, for, uh, to some extent for other countries. Not only change of the state borders, but also establishing uh, very new uh, border lines, like Polish-German border, like Polish-Ukrainian uh, border after the Second World War, also the Hungarian borders after the after the Paris Conference. And the second very important very important uh, feature uh, are the uh, mass uh, forced and voluntary uh, expulsions and uh, transfers of millions of people in the Central Europe. It's the experience of Poland, of Germany, of Hungary, of Czechia, of Slovakia, of Romania. Um, and it was very, very, very big, uh, big mass process in the years of 44, 50. Let's say maybe it, it not stopped in 50, but the, the scale was the, the mass at uh, that time. So, it caused, for example, the depopulation of border regions, what we can observe on the Czech uh, borders, uh, Polish borders, uh, and also um, the change of, uh, of population of border uh, people. In the case of uh, Polish-Czech border, the western part, not here, uh, it was uh, nearly 100% of new population after, for, for after 1940 on the border regions. And the third feature is the 45 years of the uh, communist uh, regime and the border regime of almost closed borders in the Soviet blocs. Not only between the Soviet bloc and the uh, democratic world, but also inside the Soviet bloc we remember the regime of closed borders between Poland, Czechia, etc., and other uh, countries. So it's just 30 years now when we can uh, experience uh, the Europe, maybe not without the borders, but Europe with uh, some, mm, to some extent, open borders in Central and Eastern Europe. So here uh, we can we face some par some paradox because everything what I said we can think that it will be extremely strong to establish cross border cooperation between those territories, but in fact uh, the Polish Czech border institutions like um, like uh, for example Radkov uh, commune. Uh, like uh, Bromovsko microregion, they are in fact they are uh, leaders of uh, of uh, managing the cross-border interreg projects, according to the new uh, study of of, of Sylvia Dozbosz from Wrocław. So, uh, the the number of uh, interreg initiatives are very uh, very high in these regions, but the. Um, 
Now I am going back to the three dimensions of cross-border cooperation. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very um, fruitful for the first dimension, the institutional dimension of cross-border cooperation, and, but not for the functional and ideational. So in the institutional dimension, what means uh, establishing the network of professionals directly involved in cross-border cooperation, um, the, uh, the, the cross-border cooperation is a, is a success story. But for functional and for ideational, we miss something. Um, I think we still d don't know exactly what we missed. One of, the, one of the answers could be we do not have any uh, big income gap. We do not have any unemployment gap like it is, for example, on the German-Polish border where there is a, a big uh, flow of, uh, of uh, cross-border commuters. Uh, so maybe it also caused this uh, state of indifference on the Polish-Czech border. I can stop now and then maybe I can uh, join in the discussion because I see that 15 minutes. Thanks a lot for the initial statement. So now we have got some intellectual food to think about. Yeah, I guess at the very beginning I would, I would agree to your statement uh, on these three levels, on these three dimensions of the CBC. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now uh, let me approach to my principal role, which is to raise, if possible, these not stupid questions to uh, our panelists. I would love to start with Dula, as I, I can see him, he's smiling over there and he's very fine. So Dula, uh, I would love to ask you and I will ask the questions also with the modifications to the other panelists. What's your experience with the CBC? And do you consider yourself to be a border person? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really grateful for the organizers to inviting me and I'm very sorry that I couldn't uh, personally attend this meeting uh, due to the coronavirus measures uh, taken by the, uh, uh, by the Hungarian government. I would be very happy to be with you. Uh, yes, uh, I have some experiences uh, with uh, the border issues, uh, indeed. Uh, let me mention three dates from my border history. The first one is 1989. Uh, in this year, I had the opportunity to take part in a young festival in Paris and then I experienced the first time an open border at Strasbourg. It was amazing. You know, growing up in a uh, communist uh, state, as uh, uh, Mr. Opiola uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the border, borders were strictly guarded and the people who wanted to cross the border were threatened and, and, uh, and humiliated. Uh, so it was an amazing feeling to cross the border at Strasbourg without being controlled. So it was really amazing. Uh, 10 years later, in 1999, uh, with the uh, as, uh, financial assistance of the European Union, uh, the last uh, bridge demolished during the Second World War uh, along the Danube uh, has been decided to uh, reconstruct. It was the Maria Valeria bridge between uh, Esztergom in Hungary and Sturo in, in, in Slovakia. And this year, in this year, I was appointed uh, as the coordinator of cross-border cooperation of the city of Esztergom, and I had the opportunity to work a decade on the Easter Grano project, uh, first as a EU region and later on in 2008 as the first EGTC in Central Europe. And since uh, 2009, again 10 years later, uh, I have been working for the Central European Service for Cross Border Initiatives, the SESCI, which is a Budapest based. Uh, uh, private law association dealing with everything which crosses the border, sometimes even illegally. Uh, so we are involved in cross-border research projects. Uh, we are participating in cross-border programming and, and we create uh, 
uh, integrated cross-border development strategies, uh, projects, uh, institutions. Uh, we are participating in, in uh, uh, policy-making processes at European and national level, and we try to do our best in order to disseminate the knowledge and experiences gained during this uh, one decade period of time uh, among the local stakeholders in order to facilitate cross-border cooperation in uh, Hungary, around Hungary, and in a, more bro uh, in a broader uh, sense within the territory of the Danube strategy. So this is my history with borders, uh, very briefly. Thanks a lot. And how about the other part of the question? So I guess implicitly the answer is yes, that you would consider yourself being a border person, but then I would like not to speak on your behalf. Yes, of course. Uh, not only uh, as an inhabitant of, the, of a border area, uh, very close to this bridge uh, mentioned before, but, uh, you know, uh, there are some uh, border scholars uh, who consider the borders as not, uh, on the one hand, who consider the borders as social constructs. Uh, so borders are everywhere where the borders are constructed. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, many border scholars uh, see that the borders uh, are not uh, fixed in a certain uh, geographic position, but they are everywhere where the people are living and, and moving. So everyone is border people in this sense. But of course, there are people who are more border people than others because they are living at the administrative borders. Oh, so, yes, uh, I, I consider myself as a border person. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'd like to uh, pose the same question to Amayer to Olomouc. How about you? Good afternoon again. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I am very sorry that uh, I can't personally attend at this in uh, interesting conference, uh, but due to the viral uh, virus illness, I had to stay at home. So, uh, for the first, I'm sorry. And uh, the, to the questions. My experience with cross-border cooperation in research project is not very great. I have some scientific uh, research cooperation with Slovakia. And uh, me and Mr. Pavlicek, we are planning a scientific research article with the Academy uh, VSB, VSB, specifically with Mrs. Joana Kurovska, Pish, and Mrs. Edita novak Jolti. And uh, for when I worked at the University of Mining in Ostrava, Technical University in Ostrava, I was involved in a several cross-border projects with Slovakia and Poland, uh, specifically in Opole. And uh, these were uh, research projects, uh, but uh, that is still not enough. Uh, this is why I want to be part of the emerging cross-border platform that is now being set up at this uh, conference. And the second question, uh, I'm definitely a cross-border person because my roots go back to many countries in Europe and Asia. So I, uh, I feel that I'm a cross-border person. Thanks a lot. So I propose that we will not leave the institution and we will stay with the Moravian Business College and then we will uh, ask Adam. First. Now, uh, thank you very much uh, that I also can participate on this discussion. Uh, first, I was very nervous what I should talk about the uh, inter-border uh, cooperation because I actually didn't lead any project in that. Uh, I, uh, I'm working as an academician and I am struggling to reach some project grants for the um, uh, science uh, goals, science tasks. However, uh, uh, I have to say that I uh, live all my life on the border. Uh, when I, uh, I live in Český Těšín, it's the border city, border town, 
Uh, when I see them uh, in my breakfast, I uh, watch the Olza River and the trees uh, behind in the Poland. So I'm asking myself if I am a border person. Probably yes. Uh, um, in the Silesia, in the Czech part of Silesia, there are uh, many, many people who speak with the uh, Silesian dialect. Some people think that it is Polish. Uh, I don't know if uh, Polish people uh, from the sea uh, border, uh, sea coast, uh, understand the, this dialect. I don't think so. Yeah. But we think that we speak Polish if we speak this dialect. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, I think that our moderator could tell a lot about this. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, my, my father uh, studied Polish schools. I cannot speak Polish very well. I am really struggling if I need to talk to my Polish friends. Uh, however, I think that uh, almost everywhere in Europe uh, you must think that you are a border person because everywhere are borders. Everywhere are some borders. Europe is, is divided so, by so many borders, uh, borders uh, from the historical point of view that probably we need to overcome the borders all our lives. However, I would like to uh, say just, just a few words uh, concerning my practical experiences um, uh, with my life on the border. Uh, I have a family, uh, two children. Uh, we cannot imagine now uh, the living without the open border. Yeah? As, as uh, a colleague uh, uh, told, uh, there was a time when the borders was, uh, was closed, even uh, in between the socialist uh, bloc uh, countries, there was not possible, possible to go to the border without permission. Yeah? Later, there was so-called the, the small border uh, contact, yeah, which uh, was allowed only to pass the border for the people, uh, I think, 30 kilometers uh, from the border. Yeah. But it, is, it was uh, much better. And now, how long is it? Uh, maybe uh, 20 years uh, when the uh, Schengen is uh, for us open? 14, uh, 14 sorry. Yeah. And the situation is, is incomparable. I think that never, maybe never in history was like that. And it is wonderful for us. Yeah. We, if I want to go to with, our, uh, with my children uh, to swim, we are going to Polish swimming pool, which we have five minutes from our home. Yeah. If you want to go to market, we are uh, going to uh, buy Polish foods. Yeah. Uh, we are, uh, with my wife, uh, going to, uh, to uh, walk uh, in the night to, through the uh, alleys of the uh, Cheshen. So we think that um, it would be very, very, um, uh, in natural to uh, feed back this uh, state uh, before the period uh, when the Schengen uh, situation is uh, right now here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would really appreciate uh, that uh, the situation is like that and I, I hope that we will uh, develop it in future. However, of course, uh, I understand that borders have some sense. Yeah, there is, from the historical point of view, it was a, a sense of protection. Yeah? And now we see that even in this time of COVID, we need some kind of protection. And we maybe appreciate uh, that. Of course, it's, it's difficult for us, but maybe it, we can protect ourselves. Uh, there are uh, even uh, maybe s uh, some other risks. Yeah? Many people are afraid of uh, migration, which is uh, in one hand, a policy of, uh, of European Union. In other hand, it is uh, of many people. It is uh, understood as a big threat. Yeah? So, uh, this is also the reason why the uh, borders should work somehow and have, should have uh, should have the protective uh, function. Uh, so, uh, I uh, may say that I uh, I'm really glad that I can uh, that I can cooperate with uh, cross border. Um, countries as is for me Poland and Slovakia of course you know Czech people uh, in my age uh, still understand Slovakia as their own country because we are born we have in our uh, birth certificate uh, written that we are Czechoslovaks not Czechs yeah? so I feel <laughs> as a Czechoslovak yeah? so uh, maybe Slovakia is for us uh, still more even closer than Poland yeah? but um, uh, 
I appreciate that there are people which uh, struggle to develop this cross-border uh, cooperation because they are very, very important, I think. And uh, there are some maybe um, uh, historical, um, um, not really uh, periods which we like in Europe, yeah, and there was some uh, problems between uh, nations and between borders, but uh, now I think that the situation is really, really good, and let's let's uh, hold it and uh, develop it in future. Uh, so I, I feel myself to be a border person. Thanks a lot. So Adam presented as actually a concept to which we as the border scholars like to work with, and this is border as an opportunity. So Adam presented us while he exploits in his almost daily life the opportunities that he can go with the children to swim in the Polish swimming pool on the other side of the river. So this is about the complementarities and this is about the understanding of the border as a resource. Now, if I may ask the same question to Professor Katarzyna Tobur Osadnik, then I would love to do so. No, sorry. Um, uh, when I saw this uh, question, at first I think about my uh, projects. But now when I uh, heard your uh, presentation, uh, I think uh, we talk not, on, not li uh, only about funds, uh, but we uh, talk um, about a very wild cross-border cooperation, but about me. Uh, at first, uh, I've uh, been working with uh, Ostrava, at first with Faculty of Mining, because I'm minor. Uh, and second, yes, I'm minor, really. Um, and next, uh, with Faculty of Safety Engineering. Um, and of course, not in the deep minor, I can't, um, but about uh, technology. Um, and uh, I think uh, I'm working um, with my partners, with my colleagues, about 15 years, maybe. Um, I work in the progress program. This was the progress free. Uh, and uh, we built uh, three lateral uh, cooperation with uh, Slovak universities, Czech universities, and uh, Polish university from Opola, too. Uh, and um, uh, we, of course, uh, with our wor uh, works, uh, workshops and meetings, we are building the network. Network is um, very, um, for me, it's very important. Uh, that's why, because network is very useful for academic exchange and for uh, project application. Um, with uh, the Faculty of Safety Mining, uh, we get the Interreg program, Interreg fund, uh, and next, after that, we get a structural product um, where uh, we, me, um, were the partner. Um, that's why I think uh, this network uh, is for us, for scientists, uh, very important. Um, next part of this question is um, would I consider myself as a border person? Maybe I will start from the joke, because of course, yes, because ever since I was a child, um, I would uh, watch Czech uh, TV, of course, fairy tales. And that's why I met the border uh, people. Of course, um, this is obviously a joke, but, uh, but it is positive experience for me. And such positive experience built our community, uh, border community, not only border person, I think. And um, despite national borders, of course, um, our action, um, it's the basic for our existing, I think. That's all. Thanks a lot. Now I'd like to pose the same question uh, to Katarzyna's cooperation partner, Professor Bohemil Horák. Thank you. Cooperation. 
I have uh, different feelings by cross-border cooperation. Before 250 years, we start to build our borders between Poland and Silesia. And this is a big problem, but in before 250 years, we have one language. We have um, sometimes Czech king, sometimes Poland king. And we have a logistic road from north to south. We have uh, very similar uh, living conditions. We have very similar um, working conditions. We have uh, black cool. We have uh, mountains. We have uh, ideas about uh, make something together in this time. And this was broken. This was broken through a technical revolution or scientific technical revolution, but was built a, a railway from the south to the north, but they finished in the Bohemian. And another railway is coming from Berlin to Krakow. They are not planned together. And cooperation is about uh, common ideas, common uh, uh, work, and uh, common discussions. You see the situation in COVID time, we talk not together, but we have uh, completely other restrictions. And this is the problem. And uh, we work on future cross-border cooperation, but it's important. This is, maybe we, we work for this, but I am 50. This is the, the plan for war life of uh, other new generations. And we need to educate new generations for the cooperation and for to work together, for understanding that the language is no problem. And this is this. And with Joanna Kurovska, we worked together past four years, and we have our programs, but not, this is not cross-border cooperation, this is cross-border education. We educate young people on the level basic schools, on the level middle schools, on the level of universities to work together, talk together, and make something together, and think about that is, does this not change in the future, maybe by politicians. This is my opinion about cross-border cooperation. Uh, thanks a lot for this. Now, let me close the first round with addressing Professor Gabriela Pascario. She will address us from, from Yashi, so this is the city on the border between Romania and Moldavia. Uh, so then, Professor, she is an expert in the cross-border cooperation with the neighboring countries, I guess probably Moldavia, and she published a great book published in a very uh, prestigious uh, publishing house, Springer. So I, I'm very happy that you are with us because you are the competent person to talk about. So if I may repeat the question, what is your experience with the cross-border cooperation and if you consider yourself to be the border person? Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, me and uh, I congratulate for organizing uh, this, uh, this great event, especially uh, because I know that it's difficult to, to organize in a hybrid formula. Um, we have some challenges in this period uh, in our university. Um, about uh, my experience, um, I tried to, uh, to project um, um, Yash and um, the closed uh, cities of the um, Republic of Moldova, Kishnau and Ukraine, uh, Chernitsky, um, are the two cities uh, from outside of the EU um, um, involved in uh, various projects we, uh, we coordinate in our university. Um, about uh, my experience, um, I have um, um, 
I mean, I have some experience, of course, uh, being involved in uh, various uh, cross-border cooperation. Few years ago, I coordinated um, a project financed by a neighborhood instrument, um, um, a cross-border um, uh, uh, cooperation program. Um, I think as um, uh, proposed to to establish and de develop two center for European studies in uh, universities from Kishno and Chernivtsi as a um, basis for future cooperation, and I'm uh, very glad to to um, um, to. Uh, told you about this project because um, uh, it was um, a very good um, opportunity to develop new projects. And uh, now I um, would like to do, draw your um, attention to another kind of uh, cross-border uh, cooperation project financed by Jean Monnet Action. I, uh, I think that uh, some of you uh, know this, uh, this um, um, acts of uh, this project uh, included in Erasmus um, program. Um, being uh, in living and uh, working in a, in a border region, we consider that um, uh, it's very important to support cross-border cooperation as, um, of course, cross-border education. And we have in uh, the Center for European Studies, I uh, I um, coordinate uh, two research axes. Uh, one uh, research um, axe uh, focused on regional development and uh, the peripheral areas of uh, Europe. And the second uh, axe of research focused on um, um, European, um, Eastern European neighborhood. And um, um, the last project I coordinate um, through the Jean Monnet uh, program is focused on the CBC uh, cooperation and um, um, CBC, uh, CBC uh, cross-border education. Uh, we have in this project 11 partners from Poland, uh, Belarus, Hungary, uh, Ukraine, and Republic Moldova universities, but also um, uh, NGOs. And um, uh, even if uh, first year of the project it was I can I can so um, a kind of uh, impossible mission. It was very difficult, for, um, especially um, considering uh, the legislative and procedural uh, procedural differences between uh, all these countries. Now, um, I uh, after uh, three years of of uh, the project implementation, I would say that uh, it uh, it was a very good project to meet us to to have joint activities to to have the joint researches and i hope to to uh, finalize uh, successfully finalize this project uh, because we received one year or more from um, uh, european commission considering the limits uh, of the last semester uh, generated by um, covid-19 um, pandemic uh, um, also, in our uh, university, we uh, coordinated uh, some Erasmus uh, Mundus project with partners from Ukraine and uh, Moldova. Um, we have um, joint um, bachelor programs, uh, master programs, and um, even if um, I do not consider myself a boredom person, because uh, um, considering the semantic uh, issue, in Romania, border is associated with uh, poverty, low performance, uh, social marginalization. Um, I uh, consider um, uh, that I have a responsibility uh, with my team, of course, to, um, to promote um, uh, cross-border cooperation in, uh, in the education and um, um, uh, also to, to contribute to the better understanding of um, um, the border um, challenges um, and to, to try to contribute to contribute uh, in a small uh, uh, with a small piece with a small uh, um, add value to to the very difficult uh, um, uh, challenges in um, um, for for uh, the border regions of EU. Um, so. Um, I um, I think that uh, we could also uh, do more for uh, for cooperate with uh, with our partners from uh, Moldova and Ukraine, and I hope to do to do it in uh, the next year. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you very much. So. Uh,
Uh, we are quite impressed by the scope of your activities and by the prestige of the research grants you managed to obtain. We would love to congratulate you. And you. if we may stay in SKU, uh, are you aware of some model example of the cross-border cooperation project which really contributed to the territorial development of this borderland? Uh, yes, uh, for, um, our our university coordinators few uh, few years um, uh, few years ago uh, a very important uh, project focused on uh, the envir uh, environmental issues. Uh, I think uh, project uh, financed with three million of euro, and um, also um, a lot of projects are um, are. Um, coordinated by uh, our institutions uh, from YASH and uh, from uh, department. Um, the cross-border relationships are very intensive, uh, especially with Moldova, Republic of Moldova, in my, uh, in my region and in my city. Thanks a lot. So now, as you could have mentioned, we slowly moved to the second round of the questions. And we have got here the experts. So if I may ask now the colleagues of the Moravian Business College, so if I can ask uh, Amir and Adam, how about would be the, their example of the cross-border project which really contributed to the territorial development? It doesn't necessarily have to be linked with your scientific work or practice. It can be based also on your ex personal experience. Thank you. I don't know if Omar is <laughs> listening and would like to answer first, or... Yes, I am listening, but uh, because you are older than me, Adam, so I think that you can start. <laughs> That's what I expected, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, as I, as I told, I'm not very specialist to the inter-border cooperation, so I don't would uh, mention any specific project, but of course I would appreciate uh, the program Interreg, which uh, I think that uh, many uh, many Czech uh, companies are um, um, connected and uh, reach uh, are trying to reach the uh, subventions from that uh, program. Uh, uh, even uh, if, uh, if they sometimes criticize that uh, the uh, bureaucratic uh, load is quite big, yeah? uh, but I think that from that uh, program as well as from Visegrad funds and uh, Erasmus, uh, from the point of scholar. Uh, uh, there was uh, done uh, quite a lot of projects with uh, um, uh, big impact. Uh, what I appreciate is, uh, but I don't think that th these are uh, uh, finance from that uh, programs I mentioned, but I would uh, uh, appreciate the infrastructure development and the interconnection of the um, Czech part of Silesia with the uh, Polish part of Silesia, for example, the, the finishing of the highway, uh, also uh, the building of the bridge in Czeski Cieszyn Cieszyn, which is quite some time ago, however, it was a big step for the connection of these two countries uh, from the point of uh, uh, road uh, traffic. And also, I would uh, I appreciate the um, um, uh, improvement in the uh, sphere of environment. Yeah? That's it. This is uh, really important. Um, a branch or, or sphere which is uh, now under uh, the focus of uh, policies of uh, or, or world, we would say or also European Union. Uh, uh, and I think that it is still a lot of uh, 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 many, a lot of uh, issues and questions we need to solve uh, uh, in the environmental sphere. Yeah, so, but a lot of uh, also a lot of was already done. For example, the gasification uh, of the. Uh, Silesian uh, of the Czech part of Silesian region. I think that the Polish part is still uh, in progress. Uh, uh, so the production of the emissions, uh, which is in, in Silesia was always a problem. It was, uh, in my uh, point of view, maybe it was uh, one of the most important benefits for the uh, life uh, in uh, the regions of Silesia. If I may uh, say, I see uh, for the future uh, three, three general um, uh, spheres where, where I would like to see the development of uh, 
uh, CBC. It is the cultural sphere, of course. Uh, I would state just, just, just one point. If I listen to Czech radio, I never hear, never hear Polish song. Never. Uh, why? Why should I listen to English songs and not Polish sometimes, even one a day, for example? <laughs> but why, why is that uh, like that? Yeah? We are close culturally so much, and uh, for example, it is, it is uh, un for me, um, I'm not able to understand why the situation is set like that. Yeah? Uh, second thing is always, is, is of course, the development of business uh, connections. This is uh, uh, a long, uh, long um, way. Yeah, because uh, still it's possible to develop and improve business connections. Um, in Czech Republic, the policy uh, or the media, me, uh, the um, attitude in media presented that, um, for example, uh, the grocery of Poland is not so good. Yeah? But it's, you know, we know that's not true. Yeah? We know that uh, the uh, Polish food is perfect, wonderful, we like it. Yeah, but uh, the, uh, uh, how they present it uh, in media is different. Why? Yeah, because media is uh, owned uh, mostly by the Western uh, gentlemen and uh, uh, owners, and they want to sell us their food, not Polish. Yeah? So uh, I, I would uh, uh, be glad that in that, for example, the cooperation can be much better. And uh, of course, uh, environmental, I already mentioned, and of course, uh, what uh, Mr. Horak mentioned, and I, I see it as very, very important, is the education in the cross-border cooperation. Because uh, we would like also uh, our children uh, like to uh, uh, our partners from the uh, cross-border. Yeah? So, so the education in that is for me important. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the message. I've got the good news for you. Until yesterday, I haven't heard a Polish song on the Czech radio neither. This changed. Historically, it was yesterday. It was radio station Chas Rock we have, and I heard there the song by Lady Punk, Stacja Warszawa. So they really played it yesterday. I can witness it. It was around noon, which was a good news. When I went in Martin's Duda car, where we moved from Vysoká škola Baňská to the center of Ostrava. Now, let me come to Amir, uh, as the younger one of the couple, to complement the question. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I have... Uh, uh, okay, I can underline everything Adam said. As for my person, uh, so far, I have not personally solved such a project at uh, Moravian Business College in Olomouc. Our university solves many cross-border projects with Poland, Slovakia, Austria, and German, as Adam said. But uh, uh, I'm not a participant of this project. I have experience only from working at Technic University of Ostrava. I, if we will speak about field of uh, cross-border projects. And um, in uh, this university, I mean Vysoká škola Bajnska, Technic University of Ostrava, uh, we solved cross-border projects with Poland and Slovakia. These were projects subsidized uh, by the European uh, Union. And the first project, uh, which was solved uh, with the Slovak side, concerned the construction of a new type of wooden buildings. And it was a research project. And part of this project was also the education of students and uh, some PR activities. The second project, uh, which was sought with the Polish side, as I said, uh, half of an uh, hour ago uh, with Opol University, was purely educational. And uh, its main goal was to start further scientific uh, and research cooperation between the Technic University of Ostrava, Fizikala Škola Bajnska, and the uh, university in uh, Opole. It's all from my experience in the field of cross-border cooperation. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you might have realized that we were joined uh, by our panelists uh, from Moldova. Concretely, Rodika Krudu, please uh, correct me if I mispronounced your name. I'm sorry, my Romanian is not a perfect one. Uh, we, we are very happy that you are with us. And 
we would love uh, to start sharply. How about you? Could you mention some kind of model example of the cross-border project that contributed to the territorial development of the borderland? So welcome, sorry for the sharp start, and the floor is yours. Um, hello to everyone. Yes, uh, sorry for being late, but I was uh, stuck in, <laughs> I was attending, in fact, another uh, online uh, event. So hopefully I didn't manage to, to catch a little bit from this event for this important event. Uh, first, I'd like to, let me introduce a little bit uh, myself. My name is uh, Radika Krudu. I'm a PhD associate professor and dean of the Faculty of International Economic Relations from the Academy of Economic Studies of Moldova. So uh, my experience in cross-border cooperation, in fact, uh, I see here my colleague, uh, Mrs. Gabriela Pascari, which was the, the manager of my first cross-border cooperation, which I get involved in. Uh, I don't know if Mrs. Gab uh, Pascari have mentioned about that. It was a uh, um, cross-border educational exchange in European studies a favorable framework in the diminishing of the border effects at the eastern frontier of the EU. It was a project that was uh, implemented in, if I'm not getting wrong, in 2010-11, uh, if I'm not getting wrong. Um, so the experience in this project was to, to foster the mobility of um, of uh, students and professors specialized in EU studies such, in such a way to promote the values and principles of the European integration uh, educational programs in this film. Uh, it, uh, referring to regarding your question, a model example of the cross-border project that contributed to the territorial development of the borderland. First of all, it's worth to mention that Moldova uh, is in the, the, the entire, let's say, territory of Moldova is uh, eligible for participating in cross-border cooperation. It's not just some regions, but the entire territory of the country. And uh, since 2014, the, um, let's say, the tool for, for cross-border cooperation has changed. We do, we do not have any more bilateral, bilateral, uh, multilateral or trilateral relations as we get used to have in the past, but we have bilateral uh, or operational programs, Moldova-Romania. Uh, and what I, I wanted to, uh, to give an example in here of a project that Moldova is benefiting of in, in this time frame, 2014-2020, that the uh, project regional cooperation for preventing and combating cross-border crime uh, is a project that is implemented between Romania and Moldova. Uh, with a total value of more than 12 million euros. So the main objective of this project is to increase the security in the eastern borders of the European Union. The, the main, uh, let's say, channels by which they do this is to rehabilitate police station in the border area between Moldova and Romania, um, training police personnel as well as purchasing equipment. Another project that is that is worth to be mentioned, especially in conditions of COVID-19 pandemics, is the um, Mobile Emergency and Resuscitation Release Service. This SMURT yeah, project is the project that aims to increase the safety of the population by developing the capacity to intervene in the emergency situation uh, in Republic of Moldova, uh, and uh, I, I would love to um, to use this opportunity to, to thank um, Romanian authorities of being so open to cooperate with us and stand along, being solidar with uh, with uh, population from the Republic of Moldova, especially. I'm talking here about the medical staff as well as uh, simple citizens that were in so need 
of, of these services. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, I'd love to uh, ask uh, the Katarzyna and Bohumil, how about you, your opinion on the like good success story of the cross-border project, which really contributed to the territorial development of borderland, if I may start. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I think we have uh, many projects, not only scientists, but the uh, social, especially, and cultural. And when um, I think about the model example, I think the International Theatre Festival uh, Without Borders in Czechian is the, for me, uh, it is the modern uh, example. Because about 30 years, we have the festival without borders. Uh, and of course, in this year, uh, we um, we didn't have, I think, but the next, yes, I saw the new um, site, new, 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 yes, let, let's open. Uh, and uh, for me, this is the mod ideal, ideal model uh, for uh, these programs. The next, I think um, we have uh, a lot of um, programs uh, for uh, people for um, uh, because we, for example, we have a lot of bike lanes. For example, uh, the Witches Trail bicycle, it is from Nisa to Olomouc. And uh, here we have the uh, Iron Bicycle Trail. It is uh, during the uh, Iron uh, Trail, like um, railway. Uh, and it is very interesting for bicycles. Uh, from Poland, from uh, for Silesian people without borders. Uh, and of course, uh, we are all also um, uh, have many um, projects, uh, but imp to improve the climate and uh, fight smoke. You all said about it. Uh, I heard about um, project. Uh, he finished uh, researches, and um, I think now we have or will we have the special monography about uh, this is very interesting because um, the research will um, had be provided uh, in um, Ostrava and in Opola and Katowice and uh, I'm waiting for this monography really we are looking forward to now like the Czech side of the partnership thank you I have problem my problem is the money first, then uh, race for the financing, the race for the money in past 20, 25, 30 years is a big problem for me. But we have, um, from my personal side, we have a, a different um, strategy for doing something. Uh, I explained this in short. But this is very important for the idea of future cross-border cooperation. And you see the completely chain of the steps and activities, they, they have this direction. Uh, but not yet, maybe in future. Uh, we make a lot of the activities. They supported knowledge and they supported of the industry in the region. My university was moved from the Příbram, from the city Příbram, near of the Prague, in the 1945, after the Second World War, to support of the technologies on the region and support a uh, craft of the industry, craft of uh, metallurgy and craft of uh, black coal mining in this region. But the socialist state need a uh, steel and need a uh, black coal. Yes. Very similar situation is in Katowice and Czechian region in the Poland. And uh, in the past years, we uh, start uh, a lot of the activities. Uh, they are connected with my idea and my direction of the study or my direction of activities at the university. And this is the, the measurement and control of renewable and alternate energy sources. We start with activities powered by sun. This is the photovoltaic solar systems and these knowledge to secondary schools. 
we start with activities Robotic League. And today, uh, robots, line follower, this game is played in the Poland, in Czech Republic, but we play this every month in region between the secondary schools. Uh, uh, before years, we think about, okay, we have in Cheshin a very agile uh, partner, the Trianon, and Trianon think about this, that spread the activities with secondary schools together with university. And the Trianon say, okay, we have free places. And we use these free places for the hobby clubs of the youth people to to meet together, to make something together, to get the knowledges, and the people from the university make uh, supervisors. And we start to build a common research and monitoring center in Czeski Teshin. This was uh, 2010. In 2015, we equipped these buildings by technology, energetic technology. They demonstrate uh, uh, energy and water independent family homes. And we start with building first charging station for electric cars, but not only for charging of own electric cars, but supervising persons, they make supervision of the uh, common work of the students in these uh, buildings in Český Těšín. They first moved from the Ostrava to Český Těšín with electric cars. My team was the first, we built self the electric cars, we provide 15 years electric cars in operation for this reason. But this charging station in Český Těšin is not only station for charging of the electric cars, this station alone discharged the electric cars and used the rest of the energy in the electric car for powering of the building. This is the future of accumulation of the energy. And in this time, we start thinking about cooperation. We propose cooperation to Warsaw, to Lodz, to Opole, to Wroclaw, but we start to propose the cooperation mostly to the universities with the same direction, and this is the problem. And we start searching of the university that is complementary to the activities that we have. We are technical branch, and we need a business-oriented partner or social-oriented partner. And this is very important. We find this partner in uh, Academia VSB. This is very important for us, and this is this idea that they, we support it in next financing by Interreg. This is, the, this is not financing first, but we start with the activities, we start thinking about what we're doing in the future, and maybe we get the financing. And we were financed past four years. After four years, we're thinking, what are we doing in the future? And this is very interesting idea about uh, in COVID uh, time. We start before two years thinking about virtual realities. And with mouse click, you are in the Vietnam with your friend and we will talk together. With mouse click, you are on the uh, space station. Okay? And we have possibility in this terrible situation that we have, use new technologies and learn as students to work together, to be together and discuss together for the future. And contemporary situation that we have is very interesting, but we open the possibilities for next future as hydrogen technologies. This will be truly regional development. Uh, yeah, maybe. But this is technology that was uh, developed uh, before a uh, tenth of, of the years and was forgotten. Okay? But we have a common problem. This is mining water. Mining water is pumped in the Ostrava, in the Jeremenko Shacht. Uh, four pumping systems with six megawatt each pump the water in the river Ostravica. But this water is coming from whole part of the Poland. So this will be territory development. 
in, this is this in idea in motivation yeah. for future and common cooperation. But oh. in Poland, have the same situation in the metallurgy as the Ostrava. Yeah. And the metallurgy, the contemporary technology they've used past 150 years, this is the not the production of the steel, this is the production of the CO2, but we produce more CO2 in tons as tons of the steel. And this is idea how we have possibility maybe yeah. in the future uh, recycle of CO2 from the metallurgy by sequestration of the CO2 by the hydrogen and product of the hydrocarbons with, with uh, higher uh, uh, value of tax. Yeah. Actually, I'll now use the chance of being the moderator because actually let me comment on this. This is kind of the future. Both of the regions, Silesian Voivodeship as well as Moravian Silesian regions, I have got really industrial past and also probably some future. So, and this would really make sense. And I think this is a research which is, which is going firstly on the good direction. And secondly, it has a potential for real territorial development. At the stage, I, have, I may pass the word to Wojtek because I've got the feeling he wanted to contribute. Uh, yes, I wanted to have a, a last word in this round of, of the questions. Uh, just one remark uh, uh, when um, I was hearing uh, all your um, speeches. Uh, it is still all about the cooperation of professionals and not the regular uh, people. Like Professor Horak mentioned, we do not have any uh, local railway connections between uh, Czechia and Poland. And in fact, it is one Silesia divided uh, in seven in 63, if I could remember, 250 years ago. Uh, so, if the if the interreg, if the European integration is about uh, open Europe and uh, Europe without the borders, so still we are somewhere at the beginning of this of this journey because it's still the let's say creating a cross-border social capital of professionals, not just uh, creating of family ties, social ties, economic ties. Still, if, uh, if regular people do not have any demand uh, to, to go to the other side of the, any interest to go to the other side of the border, uh, we will face this problem. Uh, it's not only important what we uh, discuss about, but also what we do not talk about. We do not talk about the hundreds of uh, villages, cities, towns, uh, uh, we just say about the uh, Cieszyn mostly and Ostrava and, 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 and Katowice. Thank you. Well, but we will go later on. Yeah, later on we are going to... We are the, yeah? Sorry. Yeah. I have, I have a idea. Please. Today right. after lunch is good that I have idea. This uh, cooperation, this is not possibility. This is the need, very important need. But the Romans, before 2000 years, they have a, a set divide at impera. And we are divided. And if we are together, this is the future. And if we are divided, we have no future more. OK, thanks for this. And now, I don't know whether Jula is still with us, because I don't, oh yeah, you are, I'm sorry. You know, I've almost made a fatal mistake. And I know that you are really experienced in the concrete cross-border projects contributing to the territorial development of the borderland. Can you mention the one or two illustrative ones, if I may ask you? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have some theoretical problems with this because, you know, what do you mean territorial development? And let me quote here two of our speakers from the morning session. Uh, first, uh, Professor Marina Andeva, who underlined based on uh, her uh, researches, uh, and this statement is uh, really underpinned by different scholars that territoriality is fundamentally uh, embedded, embedded in, in a nation state paradigm. You know, territory cannot be separated from nation states. 
And let me quote here uh, Mr. James Scott, who uh, promoted the place-based approach to be applied in border areas. And what we can uh, uh, witness, uh, not only during the COVID crisis, but uh, uh, more generally, that the nation state paradigm resists the place-based approach, the place-based space building process uh, taking place in border areas, you know. So, of course, we can mention some, some projects which uh, contributed to territorial development, but what do we mean territorial development in a cross-border context? It's a very important question. Let me mention the example of Torneo and Haparanda. These two cities are working together uh, uh, between uh, Finland and Sweden. And they have uh, an integrated city heating system, for instance. They have an integrated secondary education system. They have a cross-border golf cars. They have uh, they managed to uh, uh, set some uh, uh, letter boxes on the two in the two cities in order not to send the letters from uh, Haparanda to Stockholm, from Stockholm to Helsinki, from Helsinki to Torneo, but directly they can get uh, the mails uh, put by the people in the letter boxes. So I think this is something which is about territorial development because we should concentrate not on the uh, economic and social uh, development. It, when we are speaking about territorial development, we stay in the framework of the of the nation state, and then we will uh, uh, get a lot of projects which have two uh, territorial development uh, effects. One in one in, in 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 one country and another in another country, but they are not uh, interlinked, and they are not uh, joined uh, in a cross-border uh, sense. So I think that what we should do it is something which uh, Katarzyna uh, mentioned, uh, the cultural festival, by which you can change the discourse on the border, by which you can change the. Uh, behavior of the people uh, and the uh, experiences of the of the people regarding the border let me mention but a few examples how do we try how, how we try to use the egtc the european grouping of territorial cooperation uh, uh, with a view to changing the border discourse and to create new soft spaces uh, crossing the borders uh, for instance, the Small Project Fund of the Slovakia-Hungary Interreg 5A program is managed by two EGTCs, the Rabo Danube Wach EGTC in the western and the Via Carpatia EGTC in the eastern part of the border section. These groupings are permanent invitees of the monitoring committee of this same program. Uh, uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, how to say, uh, attempt to, to cross the border by the Isagranum EGTC, which has its seat in Hungary, but which participates in a cross-border ferry construction project as the Slovak partner. So the EGTC, which has a seat in Hungary, is the Slovak partner of the project, and they will operate the ferry port on the Slovak uh, side of the border. The TISA EGTC, uh, was the first uh, grouping in Europe involving a third country member, and this is Transcarpathian region from Ukraine, and they are constructing now uh, the first ever solid waste treatment plant in Transcarpathian region. It's very important for us because every year the rivers and the tributaries of the Tissa River uh, brings uh, some hundreds of tons of waste uh, by the river from Ukraine, uh, where there is no uh, solid waste treatment at all. So it's a big challenge for Hungary. So the EGTC TISA uh, will uh, construct the, the first ever solid waste treatment plant in order to uh, reduce the uh, volume of this pollution. And uh, the same EGTC is uh, assigned to 
coordinate a project uh, aiming to uh, explore and rehabilitate the older uh, and collapsed salt mines in Solotvino, uh, yes, again in, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, two more examples, the Muraba IGTC, which is located in the Hungary and Slovakia, uh, Slovenian border and which involves the uh, national self-government organization of Slovenians in Hungary and the national self-government organization of Hungarians in Slovenia. Uh, the Muraba IGTC develops an integrated cross-border silver economy and elderly care system involving the elderly homes from the both sides of the border in order to share the, the uh, uh, economic uh, burdens uh, when uh, operating these elderly homes. And the Mura region, EGTC, is located along the Hungary and Croatian border and it tries to uh, reanimate the tourist flows along the Mura river, which uh, was uh, uh, mined uh, during the Balkanic wars uh, in the 90s. So I think that these examples can uh, underline how do we consider development and not territorial development, but development of a new discourse on a, a soft space across the border. Thanks a lot. I just got an instruction that I should have been stricter, but it's too late anyway. Let me let me launch, uh, let me merge two COVID-related questions into one. And still I'd like to address Jula once I have him online. Jula, uh, what did the COVID-19 pandemics like take from you and what did it give you on the other hand? And do you think that it will, what kind of influence uh, will this have on the CBC in Europe? And I will be very cruel, please do it in two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so personally, it was very good to me because I could spend a lot of time with my family, with uh, what I could, couldn't do before it uh, for two decades, you know, because I had so many things to do with the borders <laughs> everywhere in Europe. So I would like to uh, mention that I think that uh, this pandemic regarding the cross-border realm uh, drew our attention to a very, very important thing. Because we used to speak uh, about cross-border cooperation uh, within the framework or the interpretation framework of the single market. We used to speak about the uh, European economic territorial social cohesion. Uh, and uh, most of you might know Hank van Houten's uh, article on the three uh, schools of uh, geographic research on borders and he differentiates between flow approach which is about economies the flow approach considers borders as barriers and obstacles to free, free flow of people and goods the second one is the cross-border cooperation approach which is about the cohesion of the european but the third one is the people approach and we missed this uh, aspect from our discourse at European level. We uh, were always speaking about uh, economy, single market, and uh, cross-border cooperation, cohesion, but we uh, forgot the people who are living in the border areas and who are in trouble because of the demarcation effects of the borders. And regarding the long-term uh, impacts, uh, long-term impacts of the, of the virus, uh, I made a survey uh, during the summer because I had to uh, write my PhD thesis on EGTC and a representative of, of um, EGTC located in the core area of the European Union answered that they experienced that the trust, the mutual trust has been destroyed by the COVID-19. Uh, and I think that we can uh, say anything about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, regarding economy and cohesion, but the, the most important is that, for instance, along the uh, French-Belgian border, there are many people who are using the health services on the other side of the border, and they were not allowed to cross the border during the pandemic. And I think that this resulted in that they decided not to go anytime anymore uh, uh, to the other side of the border because they had to uh, uh, find another solution 
uh, in their home country. Uh, and let me mention one more thing. Uh, unfavorable uh, changes in the European discourse, uh, which uh, you can see that the uh, REACT EU fund, uh, uh, in the REACT EU fund, the European territorial cooperation, are, uh, cooperation programs are not eligible. So they are not taken into account. And if you uh, look at the statements made by the country leaders uh, after the Maratonic uh, uh, summit in July, uh, not only our Prime Minister, Mr. Viktor Orban, uh, told that this agreement was in the interest of Hungary, but the sta same statement was given by Sebastian Kurz from Austria and Mark Rutte in the Netherlands. So the discourse is very unfavorable for cross-border uh, cooperation. However, I'm a providentialist, and this is my last sentence. I believe that uh, nothing happens without a major meaning, uh, a more important goal. So we are now challenged to do our best in order to uh, uh, improve uh, the uh, connections uh, between uh, the family members with our fellow citizens, uh, with our neighbors, and the rest of the world. Thank you. Kesanem, as we have got four minutes more, according to the schedule, which we definitely have, yeah, okay, thank you. I would like to ask the same questions to Rodika and Gabriela. Can we ask you what is your, uh, what, do, what would you think, how would, what would be the impact of the COVID on the future of the CBC in Europe? Let's start with Rodika and then go to Gabriela. We have got some technical problems. We cannot hear you. Okay, you are muted. So then I would like to ask Gabriela if possible. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, personally, in a very short uh, perspective, um, COVID-19 um, closed uh, normally our borders and uh, delayed the implementation of, um, of our project um, focused on cross-border cooperation activities. Some activities um, could not be uh, completed and um, um, this is why uh, we ask to, to the Commission to to accept um, one year more for implementation of, of our project. But most important um, is that um, this uh, pandemic crisis um, uh, strikes in uh, trust, in uh, solidarity, in, in uh, the feeling of um, belonging um, um, of the same, um, uh, of the common, uh, common space um, and um, limits um, limits uh, the cross-border um, uh, co uh, cooperation and uh, um, commodity and uh, investment uh, flows um, for especially for the border uh, for the border uh, for the peripheral and border regions um, um, as we have here with Moldavia and Ukraine Ukraine um, it's very important to understand uh, that cross-border cooperation uh, is um, could um, is it important to to farm uh, the administrative and political frontiers from our weaknesses for development uh, into an opportunity, and um, um, it's important to, to develop research uh, focused on specific challenges in uh, um, in the peripheral areas, including the COVID uh, COVID nineteen uh, impact. Uh, uh, not only in, short, in a short-term perspective, but uh, in a long-term perspective, and to reconsider the uh, relevance of cross-border cooperation, um, uh, especially, uh, and communicate uh, these aspects uh, to the policy makers, because we need uh, more place-based approaches, but we need more, more um, uh, evidence-based policies um, and um, uh, this is why I think that uh, we uh, we must uh, insist and uh, encourage all people to uh, to to develop uh, common projects and to to uh, communicate better with uh, policymakers that uh, how 
important is uh, this kind of, uh, of um, dimension of uh, territorial development. Thanks a lot. Thank I don't you. know. So thanks a lot, Rodika. Can can you hear us now? Can we hear you? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm sorry. I must give you one last minute for your opinion yeah, yeah. about the I COVID on the future. I just want to add to what has been mentioned by uh, Mrs. Pascario because she have uh, highlighted very very well those challenges that probably all the um, all the participants in the cross-border cooperation projects and not only all, all the other projects are facing now is that some of the activities that were planned uh, were simply cannot be realized i mean even those those uh, meetings that were planned to were kickoff meetings were conference were and in any other events planned in the in this project simply could not be realized. Or now, all we are putting the, in, in front of a new challenge to identify new ways to, uh, to tackle all these challenges, to find ways to, um, to, to, to do all the deliverables, to provide all the deliverables planned in the project and also to identify the new opportunities for uh, future collaboration and uh, future projects to be implemented together. The other moment is that uh, it, it's worth to, uh, to, to, to put the attention or to focus the attention on reconsidering the priority areas of the cooperation and to include in this in, uh, these discussions also the policy making authorities. Okay, so thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be very impolite because at this time I have to due to uh, time reasons and my failure to moderate the debate, which I am very sorry for. I have to finish at the moment. Before I do it, however, please let me thanks a lot to all the panelists being present here or with us online, and I think they all deserve the hand from us. So, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us on this session. And now, sh what should be, where should I, where are we going to meet? Last words from the boss, please. Boss, go ahead. Hello, hello, great panelists. Gabriela, Rodica, and Gula, and other colleagues. Uh, I apologize, but we have to stop this, uh, this panel in this moment because we have to follow our schedule. But it was a great pleasure for me to see you first time in person, especially because we started the cooperation, let's say, um, uh, um, some time ago, yes, some weeks ago. So it was a pleasure for me that you participated in our panel. I also would like to uh, thank our panelists here in Brenna because uh, it's very important to discuss about cross-border cooperation not only in, on theoretical but also on practical level which is strongly related to the projects. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> okay. So, it was my speech, very short. <laughs> Yes, but first, first we would like to uh, ask everyone to make a photo and please stay with us, stay with us, our online panelists, because we will all stay here and we will have a picture with you. Yes, please come to me. Come to me in this moment and you will be with us on the photo. So we, you will be able to see all of us. Of course, I know there are some pan uh, pandemic restrictions, but for this short moment, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>